Alrighty, uh, Canadian 627, Vancouver Centre, good afternoon. Uh, squawk code 0704. 0704 for Canadian 627. Canadian 627, uh, thank you. You're identified descending through 17-4. Vancouver altimeter is 29 or 8 9 There's going to be information alpha shortly. And uh, I'm sorry, which approach did you say you're set up for? Uh, 8 right or 8 left? Uh, I would prefer it left, if uh, possible, for Canadian uh, 627. All right, Canadian 627, no problem. Given the time I got in here, uh, you can plan runway 08 left. Descend now uh, 7,000. We'll plan for it left and down to 7,000 for Canadian 627. All right, everybody. Uh, good afternoon once again from the controller scopes. Captain Nabs here with you, and uh, hopefully you guys can hear that. Hopefully the uh, volume's okay. It looks like it's actually just over modulating a little bit, so I'm going to turn this down just a hair, both for myself and for the uh, pilots there, because it looks like in both cases it was kind of over modulating a little bit. So there you go, just a little bit, just so it's not like uh, distorting itself here. And uh, welcome aboard another. Uh, VATSIM ATC stream. We are here live in uh, Vancouver Center now, and uh, we are getting ready for. Uh, da, 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 and it looks like this guy's off course already. And uh, Canadian 627 Vancouver, it just looks like you're a little bit off course there. What fix are you direct to? All right, now we're direct to uh, Lanny uh, and then Mills, uh, Canadian 627. All right, uh, Canadian 627, those are not on the uh, Canuck arrival. So uh, turn left heading, uh, let's make it heading 200 vectors for the uh, ILSA left. Right, uh, 200, Victor 08 uh, left for uh, Canadian uh, 627. Thank you. And who is this guy taxing out for departure on a tailwind, 26 knot tailwind departure? Holy Jesus, that's a long, that's a big tailwind. <laughs> uh, all right, let's get these guys tagged up here. So, uh, yeah, I just got logged in here. We got, uh, we have Oakland Oceanic online? Get the way, get the. Get the fork out of town. <laughs> Oakland Oceanic. I never see Oakland Oceanic. Center, good afternoon, Air Canada 3 Heavy. Requesting turn to Tokyo Narita. Air Canada 3 Heavy, Vancouver. Before I give you the clearance here, uh, Vancouver winds are showing. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, sorry, disregard. Um, you are cleared to. Uh, let's see here. You're clear to Narita. It'll be the. Uh, Vancouver 2 departure off of runway 08 uh, right and squawk code uh, 0776. Okay, I'm coming up to be heavy. We'll turn to Tokyo Narita. Vancouver 2 departure out of runway 8 right and squawk 0776. We're coming up to be heavy. Good afternoon, Center Flare 601 with you. Flight level 350, direct boost. Yeah, Canada 3 heavy. Your uh, readback is correct. And uh, are you just uh, advised when you're ready for takeoff? And we're ready to take a third Canada 3 heavy. Canadian 627, fly heading of uh, fly heading of 260, descend 6,000. Uh, I could have been heading again and down to 6,000 for uh, Canadian 627. Canadian 627, make it heading uh, 270. 270. And I... For some reason, I had 26s in my head here, so I messed this up completely. Air Canada 3, uh, you can line up runway 08 right. I've just got to get one traffic out of the way here. Center, Flare 601, radio check. Flare 601, stand by. Air Canada 3, uh, you can line up runway 08 right. It'll be just a minute for a departure for traffic. Roger, lining up runway 08 right, Air Canada 3. All right, Flare 601, Vancouver Center, Squawk Code 0770. Flare 601, Vancouver Center, Squawk Code 0770. 0770, Flare 601. And I stepped on somebody else there. Uh, last call, say again. Vancouver Center, Alaska, PC4, Asia, and good morning. At this moment, established at very, uh, fly level 380. Air Canada 5487 Vancouver Center, good afternoon. Squawk code 0722. Air 
0732 for the Alaska 54 edition. Air Canada 3, Heavy Vancouver, winds uh, 0, 5, 0, 15, gusting 26. Uh, contact me, Airborne, clear for takeoff, runway 0, 08, right. Clear for takeoff, runway 08, right, and call them Airborne, Air Canada 3, Heavy. All right. Yes. Good evening, Vancouver, Japan Air 11, Heavy with you, flight level 320. All right, first flare 601, you're identified flight level 350. The information in Vancouver, when I get a moment, will be alpha. Uh, runway 08, left for arrival. One ready to send flight level 290. Send flight level 290 and expect 08 left, flare 601. All right, Japan Airlines, what was the flight number? Is that uh, Japan Air 11? Hey, from Japan Air 11 with you, flight level 320. Sorry for that. No problem, Japan Air 11, uh, squawk ident. I did Japan Air 11 heavy. Japan Air 11 heavy, thank you. You're identified flight level 320, welcome. Alaska 5487, Vancouver, identified flight level 380, welcome. I had a momentary lapse there, and I was thinking 26s instead of 8s, even though I said it. Momentary lapse there, and it screwed the whole thing up, but what can you do? And this guy is text only, but... Uh, Vancouver Center, I can end up with heavy airborne Bromley Canyon climbing to 1,400. Air Canada 3 Heavy Vancouver, thank you very much. Identified, uh, climb 16,000. Climb to 16,000, Air Canada 3. Air Canada 3 at 3,000, turn right heading 170. At 3,000, we'll turn heading 170, Air Canada 3. Canadian 627, descend 4,000. Down to 4,000, Canadian 627. And Canadian 627, back to the left, heading 0, uh, correction, heading 260. Heading 260 for uh, Canadian uh, 627. And then here New Zealand started to taxi out. All right, we've got a bunch of stuff going on here. Oh, what happened to this guy's squawk code here? No, he's good. He's good. He's legit. And so they're just confirming for Flare 601. It's down to flight level 270. And Flare 601, actually, you continue to descend 12,000. The Vancouver altimeter 29er, 89er. 29er, 89er, and down to 12,000, Flare 601. All right. Let's see if I can get an ATIS up and running here, <laughs> since I keep promising it and have yet to deliver. Uh, da -da 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 -da, Vancouver. We're going to have uh, East. I believe it's VMC. Is it VMC? Uh, da -da -da. Who's collecting here? Okay. Who's this guy? Oh. Alaska fifty four eighty seven traffic at your uh, at your disregard. A little bit far. Air Canada 3 Heavy, turn right, heading 260. Right, turn, heading 260, Air Canada 3. There we go, that's what I'm looking for. That's a better view. All right, it is visual, it's 8s. Is there 8 left, and I was a visual 0, 8 right. Alaska 5487, uh, Vancouver traffic at uh, pretty much your 12 o'clock for uh, about 30 miles is a southeast bound uh, 737 level at 390. Alaska 5487, Roger, at this moment I cannot see the traffic at uh, the level transfer. Alaska 5047, he's at your 12 o'clock for about 20 miles now. All 
All right, text uh, only there. Canadian 627, turn left heading 170 to send 3000. Left 170, down to 3000 for Canadian 627. Air Canada 3 heavy, proceed direct Comox and climb flight level 290. Oops. Direct to Uniform Quebec, Quebec, and climb to flight level 290, Air Canada 3. Flare 601, descend 8,000. Down to 8,000, Flare 601. Canadian 627, turn, continue the left turn, heading uh, 110 to intercept, cleared ILS, 08 left. Left 110, clear for ILS, intercept, um, with 08 left, Canadian 627. Here in New Zealand just logged off when I pinged him. Fine, whatever you want to do. All right, he's still got the wrong squawk code up here. I think he had it right for a minute, or maybe I misread it. But anywho, we'll just keep on. Because it looks like he's got 1714. All right, and the other thing I'm going to do is pull up my do 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 tablet here with my spaces because I love my spaces. Put up Vancouver Center, and I've got the live winds in Vancouver now right here in front of me. Love it. Just put it somewhere where I can see it very easily. Get it back, anyways. Air Canada 3 Heavy, continue climb, fly level 340. Continue to climb to fly level 340, Air Canada 3. All right, so we got all this going on here. A little bit of a hectic uh, moment right here, and I think this is always the way it is. As I, uh, as uh, I always tend to uh, log on at the busy moments, and then quickly it all fades away. All right, what was I looking for here? Uh, just going to pull up really quickly. I have to pull up some other weather and get some more ADISs here. Uh, Because it's not very often Oakland Oceanic is online. In fact, it is pretty darn rare. Canadian 627 Vancouver, the winds 090 at 18 gust 25, cleared to land, runway 08 left. Winds copy, cleared to land, 08 left for uh, Canadian 627. It's Alaska 62, stopped ask, answering me here. Not going to help me at all if he doesn't ever answer. All right, we're already up to Bravo in Vancouver. Good times. Let's see here. There it is. That's information Bravo. All right. Uh, what was I looking for? I was looking for NPC publications, policies.
Okay, that's not what I'm looking for. Uh, let's see here. Alright, so we do have a procedure in place. I've just honestly be used. <laughs> okay, I think you'd never see them online, so Japan Air eleven heavy Vancouver. Japan Air eleven heavy, go ahead. You're about to uh, enter the uh, San Francisco uh, Oakland Oceanic airspace there. Uh, what is your time over Simlo and your requested uh, flight level and uh, Mach number? I request or, uh, Simlo, we're expecting a 2021 20, Zulu uh, flight level 320, Mach decimal 84 for uh, Japan Air 11 Heavy. And uh, Japan Air 11 Heavy uh, crossing Simlu 2021, yeah, I believe you said flight level 320, Mach decimal 84, is that correct? Correct, Japan Air 11 Heavy. Japan Air 11 Heavy, thank you, stand by. All right, thanks. Okay, so he got it corrected when ready to send 17,000. Vancouver altimeter 2987. All right, first time doing this, so uh, let's check it out, make sure I've got this right. Flare 601, descend 6,000. 6,000, Flare 601. Japan Air 11 Heavy, your Oceanic Clearance has been approved. You can contact uh, San Francisco Radio now on 131.95. Have a great flight. Okay, over to San Francisco Radio, 131.95, Japan Air 11 Heavy. Have a good afternoon. And something new here. I have never had to do a handoff to the San Francisco radio before. <laughs> uh, and Alaska 62 said he's uh, 17,297. We'll start to descent over YYJ, so that's good. Canadian 627, welcome to Vancouver. Do you have a gate in mind? Yeah, we'll take gate uh, 7 8 it's available. Uh, Canadian 627. You said 7-8? Uh, 7-8, seven, eight. Seven, eight, they firm. Canadian 627, Roger. A convenient right turn off the runway. Taxi Mike Tango and into gate 7-8. Uh, next flight, uh, Mike Tango to gate 7-8 for uh, Canadian 627. Thank you. Da, 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 da. Where's my arrivals list? Should be up here somewhere. Where is it? Why do I not have it up here? Uh, da, 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 it says it's open now, but I don't even see it. It's hiding underneath something. Oh, it's right in the middle of my screen. That's why. The trouble is it's color blended with these with these things here. So we said seven eight. So I'm just gonna put that in there. Perfect. Flare six zero one descend four thousand. Four thousand flare six zero one.
And this guy is also going to be heading this way. Do, 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 do. All right, so now I know. Never had to do that before. Every day on this network is a learning curve. Yeah, you never know when you're what you're going to learn when you're online. Just there's so much stuff out there. Just trying to make sure I've got a stream going on here. Yeah, it seems to be working. Okay, perfect. Just making sure. Didn't even have a monitor going on up here yet. Okay, so the next thing I need to do is get a couple other ADISs up so I can start luring some traffic. So um, anybody that's watching that's thinking about flying, we got hours and hours to go. Um, I got hours and hours to kill this afternoon, so uh, go ahead and log on anywhere you like in the Vancouver FIR or even uh, start a flight towards Vancouver. I'm going to be here for probably about three and a half to four hours. So uh, yeah, assuming the traffic holds out, come on down uh, and I'd love to get you some uh, ATC. Flyer 601, turn left heading 170 to send 2000. Down to 2000, left 170, flare 601. Close enough, 170. There we go. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. So let's just see here. So let's get another ATIS up and running here. Let's do Kelowna and Victoria because those are the two popular airports. Uh, crossing the sound is so fast that people love to do it. I don't blame them. So let's see here. Victoria, we're going to do uh, landing on 09. I'm assuming it's VMC. Uh, 30 miles fuel, 25,000. It is VMC. So we're doing 09 there. And then CYLW. Uh, let's see here. Looks like we're favoring 34 VMC as well, I hope. 9 miles clear, 10 degrees. It's not too bad there. It's not too bad for uh, the end of March here. Not too bad at all. All right. And the other thing I want to do here as well is just on this chart here is bring up some extra information here. So let's just make sure we've got charts How on here. Canadian six four seven. We're about full oxygen and boarding. Thank you very much for your service. You have a good one. Catch you next time. Bye. Canadian six twenty seven. Thanks so much for flying in today, and we'll see you next time. Come on. Uh, yeah, that's the one. Except it's that. Okay, so let's go airports. Let's make sure I've got this up here, and we're also going to get some note tams up here. And flare 601, turn left heading, sorry, turn left heading 050 to intercept, clear the ILS 08 left. Left Look away 050, for five seconds. Zero, <sighs> uh, intercept ILS 08 left, flare 601. The trouble is, it, it's this kind of thing where it's like, it's sort of half busy, but it's not terribly busy that people look away. And I am the first person to admit that I do it because I'm trying to manage a bunch of stuff at once, trying to get information about all sorts of stuff at once. I will admit I'm the first person to admit that I look away when I probably shouldn't. And you would think I would know by now when people are on base, don't look away. Don't get distracted by other things. 
you know, don't try and do just, oh, one little job, because one little job always ends up taking 10 minutes. Just when you think it's an easy job, it ends up taking so much longer than you ever expect. That is probably one of the most true things. Yeah, it's taking way too much space to make this turn here. Ah, shoot. I'm trying to just make sure I have all the information in front of me. Like, it's funny, like, if I was smart, I would make sure I have the information in front of me. But, like, I, I'm usually so eager to kind of, I see your traffic, and I'm so eager to get online and get going. that I, I, I connect to the network and get, get all voice connected and everything first. And then I worry about information afterwards. And it's like, it, if you want to do it properly, you would definitely try and do, get all the information in front of you first, but and then get on the network. But the other flip side of that, too, is that, like, you know, the traffic is limited, and it's not like there's anybody else online controlling most of the time. You're not stepping in and relieving anybody, so you don't have that prep time. It's like, if I step on now, I can control these airplanes. I see a bunch of airplanes inbound to the airport. I'm like, okay, let's let's do it. Let's get this, uh, let's get this controlled. These fixes don't exist anymore. Now it's Erlid. And OMRAD is the final approach fix there. He's going to get it just in the nick of time there. All right, so Alaska 62, leave my airspace to the south. Uh, surveillance terminated. Okay, so the other thing I need to just do is just look up and just see if there's any interesting NOTAMs here. Let's make sure. All right, and he acknowledges off to Unicom. I just want to see this guy turn inbound here in a second. I should have this. The center flare 601 is intercepting the ILS. You're already left. Flare 601 Vancouver, thank you. The wind 07014, gusting 24. You're clear to land 08 left. Clear to land 08 left. Flare 601, thank you. Okay, so let's do this one thing at a time here. Let's keep focused here. So I'll just look at the note tabs to see if there's anything unusual here. Uh, insert approach procedures. All right, now it's GSS 06 left, 08 left, DME, ITL. Close nightly. It's not going to affect us today. IRD, some DMEs are unserviceable here. I just left 08 left and 06 right. Unserviceable. It's tomorrow. That's fine. Like ten, da, 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 close daily every night. Zero eight left. That's fine. It's not going to impact us with this stream today. Two six left, and you got to look through these things because there's all sorts of stuff in here. Today's twenty eighth of March, seventeen hundred to twenty three hundred. ILS eight right and our runway two six left. Eight right two six left closed. That's tomorrow, twenty ninth of March. But the ILS for two for eight right is offline today until twenty three hundred Zulu. Okay, good to know. Good to know. See, these are the things you got to look for and find. Close that taxiway. Mobile crane within a sixty foot extended. Number three to read arrival departure aircraft. Here comes flare. There's a lot of notams here for Vancouver. <laughs> a lot of notams. All right, I don't see anything crazy on there. Good. 
Then I can move on to the next airport, but Flair's landing now, so we'll just get Flair on the ground here. We'll start that next Oceanic handoff, and uh, hopefully we'll lure in some traffic here. Right now, we sort of handled everything right now, but uh, I don't doubt that we will get some traffic here. It's it's early in the afternoon. It's Everything is uh, lining up for hopefully what will be a busy session. So if you guys are watching and you're thinking about uh, flying today, I got... I I got hours here, so come to come to the Vancouver FIR. I got uh, hours of ATC available to you here. Flyer six zero one, welcome to Vancouver. Convenient right turn off the runway and say parking. Right turn off runway one able, and uh, we're just going to the terminal. No assign gate. All right, Flyer six zero one. Uh, Let's see, I believe you park down uh, over where WestJet normally parks as well. So I'm going to give you gate uh, twenty, gate twenty four. All right, gate twenty four, and we vacated on Mike five. Flyer six zero one, Roger. Turn right on Mike Taxi, Mike Juliet, and uh, Lima to gate twenty four. Right turn, Mike, then taxi, Mike Juliet, Lima to gate twenty four. Flyer six zero one. I believe Flair usually parks on this area. WestJet and Flair tend to park, I believe, on this area. Air Canada kind of takes this most of this pier here, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong, and if anybody knows for sure, please correct me because I'm not, I'm not 100% an expert. It's just from my observations over the over the handful of times I've been in Vancouver. It seems to be the general pattern, anyways. All right, lady runway zero nine three. So now I'm looking at these Victoria stuff here. Six departure, authorized, Victoria VOR, runways are dry, good, 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 Kelowna, anything else? Mm -hmm. Looks like the runway in Kelowna closes during the afternoon today till 4.59 Zulu, so it's starting at 2100 Zulu. Uh, the first 1,025 feet of runway 1.6 closed. Hmm. Circuit's not authorized, so they're doing some. They are doing some work. I know that they have been doing some work in Kelowna this summer, uh, or this this year, to uh, extend the runway. Actually, extend the turning base uh, properly, make the turning base bigger, and I think extend the runway slightly at each end. So, uh, yeah, right now they're climbing. They have the north end of the runway closed. They have the south end of the runway actually extended slightly um, to not lose too much distance for the uh, departures and arrivals there. 1634 circuit's not authorized. Ch -ch 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 -ch. Have X-ray runway 16 not authorized. R and have X-ray runway 34 approach not authorized. R and have Yankee runway 34 approach not authorized. Yeah. Let's just pull up some of those approaches there, too, because, yeah, these are some of the ones that, uh, uh, yeah. Because if we're using 34, it's like the only approaches that are available, but this is going to make life very interesting for the next little while here. In Kelowna, uh, airports, show me Kelowna. And I'm realizing as I'm sitting here that I'm, didn't have a second cup of coffee today, and I could, probably could use one. So I might now that it's got a little quiet, I might step away for just a couple minutes. Not gonna be too far, but uh, we'll be within our earshot. Just make myself a cup of coffee would be nice here. Uh, all right, so let's get rid of that. So approaches. So for 34, the RNAV Zulu is the only one I have. I don't even have the RNAV Yankee. It must be a uh, private approach, but that is not indicated, anyways. All right. Uh, anyways, before I step away, let me just do this. I'm going to start this oceanic clearance. Yeah, 
Air Canada 3, Heavy Vancouver. No, for Air Canada 3. Air Canada 3, Heavy. Uh, for your oceanic clearance here, can say your estimated time over Ornai, and uh, what is your requested flight level for oceanic? Okay, uh, our estimated time to Ornai is 20, uh, 2058 Sulu and requesting an altitude flight level 340, Air Canada 3, Heavy. And Air Canada 3 Heavy, I just want to confirm I heard it correct. Was that uh, 2050 or 2058 Zulu? 2058 Zulu, Air Canada 3 Heavy. 2058 Zulu, perfect. Standby. All right, texting the Oceanic controller here. Not sure how busy he is. I'm curious because the San Francisco Oceanic is huge airspace. Huge. Goes. It is literally about a third of the Pacific Ocean, maybe more, for one airspace. It goes all the way to like, like within like a hundred knot miles of the Philippines. Covers all the way up Hawaii, all the way up towards the Alaska coastline, within like a hundred miles of Alaska coastline. Just absolutely huge amount of airspace. Not a whole ton of airplanes in it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and then this guy will be number twelve in his airspace. But I mean, if he's dealing with something at that particular moment, it's easy to kind of miss it. So, anyways, I sent in the message. Uh, the other thing I can do while I'm just sort of waiting for an answer here is just quickly do 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 do. Let's just see if Flair, yeah, Flair figured out where he's going. Oh, he missed the gate, but anyways, whatever. He didn't care too much. I'm just trying to give him something that's pro approximately the right spot in the terminal. Uh, all right, so we have a new approach for 08 left with new fixes. And I still have the old fixes on here. So now it's OMRAD is the FAF instead of uh, Bexum. So we got to take away Bexum and put up OMRAD. All right, Bexum is gone. Thunder Flare 601 is parked at the gate. Thank you for the great ACC. We'll be seeing you soon. Player 601, thank you so much for flying in, and uh, we'll see you again next time. Everyone's so polite on this network. <laughs> um, is it Omrod or Omrad? Omrad. Omrad, there it is. Boom. So that's the new that's the new FAF there now, so I just changed that one. The rest of them are still the same. Perfect. Okay, so the Oceanic Clearance has been approved. Handoff is supposed to happen approximately five minutes prior to entering Oceanic Airspace. That's five minutes right there, so he's about ten minutes away. So, And Air Canada 3, Heavy Vancouver, your Oceanic clearance has been approved at uh, flight level 340. You can expect to switch to Oceanic in about uh, seven minutes or so. Okay, Oceanic clearance approved and expecting the frequency change, Air Canada 3, Heavy. Thank you. All right, yeah, so it's a little quiet now, but that's perfect. So I'm going to grab myself a cup of coffee because I realized I did not have afternoon coffee yet. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll be right back on, uh, on scope here in just a couple minutes. Not much going on, but... Uh, Please, uh, if you're thinking about flying, please log on in and uh, let's let's get some let's get some fun going on this stream here.
Okay, my coffee is about to brew while we're waiting for that. Uh, just a quick check in here and nothing much is happening. Let's have a quick look at that spy and see what's happening there. Let's see. I have uh, right now three inbounds to Vancouver. Let's just check the stats on these here because I feel like I'm going to be disappointed in them. Uh, two almost simultaneous arrivals, 22, 25, 22, 29, and the next one, midnight 29. So I'm probably not going to be here till the midnight 29 arrival coming from Mexico City. Uh, but the other two I do plan on being here for. Uh, I, my plan right now is to stay here until uh, about midnight Zulu. So if, again, if you're thinking of flying, come on down. Uh, it's been a little while since I control Vancouver. I like Vancouver a lot, though. It's a fun center. Uh, terrain just makes it so much more interesting. You've got to really kind of think big picture here. Um, yeah, you've got to think big picture. You've got to, to cover your rear end, as it were. You've got to make sure there's always terrain clearance wherever you uh, wherever you give these guys uh, a descent to. So if in doubt, you don't give them a descent. All right, um, while I'm at it here, so since the, I know the, the approach changed on the eight left, and I'm pretty sure they changed, no, they didn't change on eight right. No, that's still tap piece. So it was eight left mainly. They changed a bunch of stuff on eight left. They changed the, the final approach fixes for the RNAV and the uh, ILS. They, they synced them up. I think they used to be different. And I think they synced them up to make it a little easier on the controllers to have one common point between the two of them, which is sensible. Like, you, you know, you've got different design parameters for an ILS versus an RNAV, but, um, you know, certainly for the controllers trying to fly them, they tend to be pretty consistent. So, yeah, I'm hoping that I picked a good time of day to log on here as well. It's uh, had a nice little rush right there at the start. That's why I kind of wanted to get on in a hurry, but then uh, not much else happened. But uh, hopefully, with a little bit of time online here, hopefully we'll uh, lure in some extra traffic here. It's just a matter of time now. we got Kelowna open, we got Victoria open, we got Vancouver open. Uh, just debating what other ATIS I should put up there. So if anyone has a suggestion, um, why am I... Uh, let's see here. My normal kind of inclination is uh, is to do uh, what is it? Fort uh, Saint John, I think, or uh, not Fort. Uh, sorry, Prince George. Um, it's usually my inclination because it's usually it's a decent flight. It's like an hour flight, so it's one that like you know it's not like a, a real quick up and down. It's a little farther afield than Kelowna, but it's one that uh, it, the trouble is it's a bit remote. It's a little bit unglamorous, if you will. So it's not one you see a lot of people necessarily want to do. But uh, yeah. Anyways, um, do, 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 do do yeah. Let's do this. Let's put up uh, Fort St. John anyways. The other one that, I, that sometimes is useful is Abbotsford, or even uh, we even could put up uh, FSS, uh, FSS um, uh, ATISs in uh, Tofino and uh, Nanaimo now if we want to. But uh, yeah, it's usually a toss-up between Abbotsford and uh, Prince George. Usually Prince George wins, even though you don't get all that much traffic up there. So let's just see what's going on up in Prince George here. Uh, winds are out of 360, so we'll do the 33s. Looks like a looks like a beautiful VFR day up and down uh, Vancouver, though. Up and down the BC coast. I, I'm not seeing any weather anyways. So let's anywhere. Uh, and everything, all the runways are bare and dry. Let's just get uh, some no tams up there for Prince George as well. Just make sure it is uh, runway edge lighting. 100 low lead fuel not available. Uh, do, 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 do. Prince George DME is unmonitored. Everything's dry. Yeah, okay, those NOTAMs are pretty straightforward. Uh, Vancouver's getting a little, little some interesting NOTAMs here, mostly just uh, some periodic closures here and there. So 2300 Zulu today, or 2100 Zulu, 8 right supposed to close. Where was it here? 8 right, 2 6 left. Uh, closed. No, sorry, that's tomorrow. No, sorry, the ILS goes on offline. The ILS is offline until 2300, so it's offline already. So no ILS approaches on to 08 right. Uh, is there is there an RNF? There is an RNF for 8 right, correct? Or is it just visuals only? There is an RNAV runway 08 right, so I'm going to change up my ATIS here, correct it. 
RNAV or visual runway 08 right. OTAMS ILS runway 08 right. On service. Okay, perfect. Air Canada 3 Heavy Vancouver, you're about to enter uh, the uh, oceanic airspace. Squawk 2000, your surveillance service terminates and contact uh, San Francisco Radio with a position report on 131.9 or 5. Roger, Squawk 2000 and contact San Francisco Radio on 131.9 or 5 Air Canada 3 Heavy. Thank you, take care, bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. And he's off. I think my coffee has brewed. Gonna go get it. There we go. What's life without coffee, right? <laughs> now we're down to one airplane. This went from kind of interesting to pretty boring pretty quickly here, as Vatsim often does. Hopefully we... Vancouver's a popular place, though. Oh, looks like uh, I do have... Oh, yeah, I do have uh, one departure there. Charlie 351, a King Air, VFR from Vancouver to... Sorry, VFR from Victoria to Vancouver. All right, so let's pull that up. Let's pull up the Victoria ground view here. There it is. Charlie 351. Beautiful. All right. So Charlie 351. We'll assign him a VFR squat code. Perfect. And then let's see what else we can pull up. Information we can pull up here. So let's do this. Perfect. Okay, so that's that. Uh, let's see here. Hello, Vancouver Center. This is uh, Charlie 351 on the ground of Victoria requesting a VFR flight to Vancouver. Charlie 351 uh, Vancouver, good afternoon. Uh, information in Victoria is uh, Alpha still. Altimeter is 29 or 85. Runway 09 for departures. Your squawk code today will be 1203. Charlie 351, squawking 1203. 
Charlie 351, that is correct. Uh, advise me ready for taxi. Charlie 351, uh, request taxi. Charlie 351, runway 09er, nine information alpha and altimeter 29 85. Taxi Echo, hold short 09er, advise ready. Charlie 351, uh, taxi via Echo, to runway 09. Just trying to figure out how to, if I can, if there's any way. Just trying to figure out if there's any way to turn up that background with the uh, minimum vectoring altitudes in it. I don't think there is. I think the color is set. It's just, it's so dark. Oh, hold on. Maybe I can. Hold on. Maybe I found it. It was not where I expected it to be, but nevertheless. Well, that definitely turned that up a little, too, a little bit too bright there. Let me change that back down about half of that intensity. There we go. But that did not change my background like I wanted it to, unfortunately. I just find that the vectoring altitudes are so hard to read on this scope. They're very Charlie faint. 351, holding short of runway 09. Charlie 351 uh, Vancouver. Left turn out uh, is approved. Contact me clearing the zone to the northeast. Vink, uh, Victoria winds, excuse me, are uh, 040 14 gusting 20. Clear for takeoff, runway 09er. Charlie 251, uh, clear for takeoff and left turn out. All right, let me see if I can find a way to uh, make this just a little bit brighter here. Uh, what am I looking for here? Da -da 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 -da. I think I know what I'm doing. <laughs> or maybe not. Let's see here. Trouble is, like, even if I change it, it's part of the default package. If I change it, it's still when the next update comes in, it's going to still go back to the same thing, I think. CCZVR. Yeah. 
This is the file here, I think. Okay, well, I think I found it, but I don't know how to adjust the color here. All right, so let's let's do a little bit of learning here. I'm going to do a little bit of digging, a little bit of learning. See if I can get this to come up here. Because uh, it's just, it's so hard to see these factoring altitudes. I kind of know what they are, but like, it, it also depends on the screen. And my, my, my screen here on my laptop is a little bit dark. Everything's a little bit saturated too, just because of the... Uh, I don't see him. Yeah, he's airborne. I don't see him on radar yet. It's a little higher. Because I don't even see a prime target, so I don't think it's a question of the transponder not being on. I think it's just a question if he's below radar coverage. kind of like to be able to see a little bit of the land there. It's kind of nice. It might have been a little bit too bright, but something like that. The trouble with the radar scope is it's so dark. If you have a high contrast screen, it's probably okay, but I do not have a high contrast screen on this laptop. Not high enough. So let me just see here. If I can research how to change this. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. Charlie three five one with you at four thousand feet. Hey yeah, Charlie three five one. Uh, negative radar contact. Just make sure the uh, transponder's on. Nothing. Why do I not see him at all? Charlie 351. Oh, there uh, transponder should be on. Sorry about that. Charlie 351, thanks. Uh, you're identified at uh, 4,500 VFR, main VFR at all times, and uh, proceed. See if I can find it here. Color codes for SCT files. Haha! -ha. That's what I'm looking for, really, at the end of the day. Okay. Blue, green, red. Do, 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 do.
Okay, so I understand how this works now. I've never done. I've never really looked at these sector files too in depth before, but I kind of want to a little bit now. All right, so let's do uh, this makes it any brighter. <laughs> All right, and if we do this, ooh, that made it brighter. I can read those now. <laughs> Charlie 351, the Vancouver altimeter is at 2987, runway 08 uh, right for arrival. There we go, I figured that out though, nice. Charlie 351, Vancouver. And, uh, expect zero 08 right for arrival. Charlie three five one. That's correct. Uh, descent at your discretion. VFR cleared right base runway zero eight right. Might even turn that just a hair lower. There we go. Now I can still see the rest of the lines because so many of the lines on this are so very faint. My biggest complaint about the Vancouver sector files is that the colors are very, very faint. They like dark colors here. And I, you kind of want a dark radar scope, but you need to be able to see the stuff that's on it. That's the, other, that's the flip side of it. Alaska 5487, you're about to leave my airspace to the northwest. The uh, Anchorage Center is not online. Switch down to frequency. Surveillance service terminates. And have a good night. We're going to come to the Southern Good night. Thank you so much for the comfort. So there, let's go Take care. All right. How are we doing for Vancouver traffic now? We got any more inbounds? Anybody interested? Takers? No? Uh, one more person took off here. Yeah, Charlie351. Yeah, that's it. And then there's a Jazz departing out of San Diego. It's not bad, but that's a little bit far away. I don't know if he'll make it in time, but... Anybody clone it? Nobody clone it? Nobody Prince George? Victoria? No, nobody. Come on, guys. <laughs> I'm going to start to get very bored here. I was debating doing Toronto, and by the time I got uh, online, Toronto had a center controller. Go figure, that guy's left now, and I'm still here in Vancouver. Toronto's not much busy right now either. But Toronto being East Coast, it is kind of really peak time for Toronto. It's still early in the afternoon here in Vancouver. It's, uh, oh, I can't even think what time it is here. Let's just do it the easy way and look at my watch. It's... Uh, Two o'clock in the afternoon in Vancouver. Yeah, that's why I'm not getting a whole lot of West Coast traffic yet. Hopefully, we can change that sooner or later. All right, let's get to Vancouver. Weather up here. There it is. He's just turning final. Love it. Charlie 351 Vancouver wins 070 16 gust 23 cleared land runway 08 right. Charlie 351 cleared land 08 right. Rutch. Come on, people. Gotta lure you in one way or another. This is not the most exciting ATC session.
Yeah, I find it very dark. And then he, like, I drop the tag on this guy and he completely disappears into the background here. They really like their stuff really dark here in Vancouver. All right. Not concerned. We could still kick that up quite a few notches there. Oh my God, makes it a little, makes them stand out a little bit more from the background. But now at least I can read all those too. So, eighteen thousand something will do. <laughs> uh, what was my color code here? I'm gonna have to remember this. Eighteen thousand five hundred sixteen. That's a pretty good color. It basically I just cranked the brightness on it. I kept the ratios the same, but I doubled the brightness of those, and that might have even been too much. But at least I can see it now. Because there's a lot of MVAs there. And everything is so dark though on this on their scopes. I don't know why. Other other divisions do not have nearly the dark scopes Vancouver has. Might need to uh, change some of the other stuff up now here. Uh, let's see. Let's turn up those stars a little bit now. There we go. Those are a little nicer to see. Yeah, it's much better. I like all that now. <laughs> that is all much better. It's much more just high enough contrast I can see what's going on. I think you guys will feel the same way now. Because it was just too little. Get this a little nicer here so I can see a little bit better what's going on here. But that definitely is a higher contrast now. You guys can read that. I can read that. We can all read that. Yeah. Charlie three five Charlie three five one, welcome to Vancouver. You can make the next right on uh, hotel and taxi hotel alpha to the apron. Need this thing since it seems to be going off anyways. It looks like he's gonna miss hotel. Maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> oh no, you made it. Let's see here. Yeah, that changed. That's about all that changed. And there he goes into the landmark. Okay. Didn't even answer me, but at least he's did that. And that's it. I got no airplanes anymore. <laughs> now the stream is going to go silent. Uh, well, at least we can talk about stuff. I, Yeah, I had uh, not originally planned to... Uh, Charlie's stream. Uh, I was thinking about streaming ATC this week. I had originally planned to do a pilot's live stream this uh, after, or uh, not this afternoon, but uh, this week on Friday when I finally had a, a day to myself. And uh, then that uh, completely disappeared on me. My schedule got changed at the last minute, and I will not have a day off on Friday, uh, which is uh, more than a little frustrating. So I, uh, 
yeah, will not be able to do a stream that day. I probably will not be able to do a stream until uh, sometime next week, possibly. So probably Tuesday or Wednesday of next week will be the next time I have an opportunity to do a, a, a pilot play stream. I might be able to do another ATC stream maybe this week. But uh, yeah, no more pilot play streams for, for uh, this week anyways, since all of my week has been filled up by work now. No time at all to spare. So it's it's been fun, but it's 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 frustrating when it gets long. You don't want to be gone from home for that long, and, and it's now push. It's now going to push six days. That's a long time. Nobody wants to be gone that long. But you do what you can. I was. Uh, I, I'm happy to say that I had promised for a little while now that uh, I was going to try and get uh, FS2 crew uh, custom voice FS2 crew voice pack for subscribing members of my channel, and. Uh, I have done the initial recording of it. I haven't actually been able to test it because I haven't been home. So when I get home, I am going to have to test this pack out a couple times, see how it works, make sure that uh, all the uh, voice clips turned out pretty well, that they all kind of work together. But uh, I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to it. I think it's going to be, it'll be kind of, it'll be funny anyways. It'll be amusing. And I, I hope that uh, uh, you guys, my subscribers, will enjoy it. It's definitely, uh, it, it, it definitely uh, could be, could be a lot of fun. Let, let me... Air Canada 26, Vancouver. All right, Air Canada 26, yeah, you're still pretty far from my airspace, so you're coming in pretty weak, but I got that you did want to step away for a little bit. So uh, just squawk a code of 0777. I don't think I'm going to see you quite yet, but uh, when I do pick you up on radar, uh, I'll uh, try and get to hold of you then. Sorry, can I get that Air Canada 26, yeah, the squawk code for you is 0777. Perfect. And uh, yeah, you can step away for as long as you need to right now and uh, just uh, give me a call this frequency whenever you're back on the flight deck. Hopefully I should be able to get you on radar by then. Okay. Thanks. All right. Even on this one, the, the other one that's bugging me is the background of the airspace is too, too dark. So let's see here if I can find... In active sector background, and you want something that's that's a little that's a little too, but you want something that is definitely noticeably lighter, not like one step lighter, you know, like on a grayscale. You don't want to be one step lighter. So that's that that's a pretty good compromise there. You can definitely see where my airspace is without. Uh, all right, got New Adis and Victoria and Kelowna. Without uh, losing too much contrast from everything else, now I sort of like that. It's just I've always thought that that Vancouver's colors on their scope are so dark. You need to have like brightness cranked to max, and even then, you just don't get enough contrast. And it's it usually looks even worse on stream than it does in person on my scope. Uh, the, the the streaming codecs usually kind of tend to to cut down on the contrast, mute the contrast to try and. Uh, uh, try and uh, achieve a better you know a better overall data rate so they tend to minimize contrast a little bit you know similar colors end up getting merged into one color just to make it a little bit easier on the on the uh the bit rate but yeah that does not help when you've got very low contrast colors to begin with so that definitely looks a lot better now i think than uh, it did before <sighs> anyways if you guys got anything you want to chat about please ask away because right now <laughs> I got nothing going on. Otherwise, I will implore you to please log on somewhere in the Vancouver sector and give me something to do. Because I got a couple hours still to kill and I got no airplanes to show for it right now. I got one guy coming in from the west here. Again, a 26 coming in from Shanghai. It's one of my arrivals. I got one other guy coming in from the east somewhere, I believe. Uh, where's this guy coming in from? Uh, oh, sorry, from the northeast. I got KLM 219 coming in from the northeast. So I got a couple of guys. A couple of guys coming in, but uh, yeah, it's been uh, it's it's a quiet afternoon in Vancouver, unfortunately. And maybe I could logged on here a little too early. I do actually have to go to work late tonight, so I did kind of want to get on and get a you know get uh, a control session on before too long. 
because I do have to uh, I do have to eventually head to work tonight. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a it's kind of a question, sort of splitting the difference, making sure I've got enough time to get online, get some get some time on a stream, um, not being too early in the day, you're not catching any traffic, but not so late that it's going to interfere with my ability to go to work. So, yeah, I got uh, I'm going to be here till midnight Zulu. So if you guys want to see some control or or have uh, have a controller anywhere in the vancouver basically anywhere in british columbia log on let's 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 do something um cologne is a little bit of a challenge with the uh, no tams in Kelowna today uh they're they're undergoing a runway rehabilitation out in Kelowna. uh not a runway rehabilitation but they're they're, they're doing some construction work on the runway in Kelowna. and since it's a single runway airport and it's kind of a little bit tight the runway legs a little bit tight especially um given you get a lot of transcontinental traffic out of Kelowna as well uh it, it, it's a little bit tight for operations there, uh, so and, and it's restricted some of the operations that are available, some of the approaches that are available because some of the approaches lead to the threshold. But uh, the thresholds right now are displaced because of the construction. There's there's construction going on the threshold, so they can't have aircraft landing directly over them. So they've had to displace the threshold down a little bit. It's making for an interesting operation in in Kelowna if we get any, anybody going in there. And a a e a e mod i e mod. <laughs> <laughs> hello, uh, hello, uh, Vatsim UK. Welcome to the boredom that is uh, Vancouver FIR. This is not always the case here by any means. This is I'm I'm a little bit surprised, but I guess it's just a weekday. It's it's especially for the west coast of Canada. It's early in the day. Uh, it's two o'clock in the afternoon, so it's a little bit early to get a lot of uh, the Vancouver locals online. So I'm hoping as the day goes on, uh, we'll build some traffic from them as well. I'm guessing it's getting yeah, it's getting kind of late in the UK for you. You're uh, here at nine o'clock. I'm looking at my clock here, and I've, I I tune Zulu time on my uh, computers now. It's just easier, especially when you're trying to control. It's just easier because then also when you do things like stream like this, the um, I get Zulu time on the bottom of my screen right there. If I put local time in there, I get local time. So uh, I basically just give up and just put my computer on Zulu time all the time, just uh, just for the sake of my Vatsim streams. Dr. Calamari III, it sounds like what's going on in Honolulu right now. However, they opted to close the entire runway for rivals and only maybe depart about halfway down. And I mean, they've got to do it. Like, And especially when you get like a single runway airport, this that, that could be a very tough operation. Um, you know, a lot of these places, the air link is, the airport is one of the major links with the outside world. Uh, Honolulu especially is a good example. Like, you know, you're on a, you're an island, so... <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you pretty much flying is the only way off of there, or taking a boat. And uh, certainly, if you're going to the mainland, uh, if you're going up to up, up to the uh, continental United States, obviously that's that's that you know taking a boat is not feasible. So aviation is is such a key link. And when you get these airports that are uh, only a single runway, taking that runway offline for any length of time is usually not an option. Um, yeah. Yeah, it can get busy in a hurry, too. All I need is a handful of airplanes, and it's going to suddenly get busy. There's my... I don't know if you guys see that, but they're right there on the left side of the screen. Air Canada, triple six, or Air Canada 26 just popped into uh, my view here with the uh, 0777 uh, squawk there. So he is there. And, uh, yeah, uh, I'm trying to think of other ones, like uh, epic ones that have happened recently. Like Toronto recently just repaved one of their three runways last, last summer, and that was a... That was a bit of a gong show for most of the summer because, uh, it, you know, with COVID recovering and, and trying to get enough throughput on the runways, really, at the end of the day, it shouldn't have been as much of an issue. What, what caused an issue was the fact that hand-in-hand uh, -hand with the runway uh, with the runway repaving was then the uh, the taxiways also had to be closed at each section. So they, 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 did, they did the runway basically in thirds. They closed the first uh, third of the runway, finished that part. Reopened it to close the middle third. Reopened it, so it 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 was uh, two four right zero six left. Which um, there's another parallel runway two four left zero six right. However, everybody who lands on that runway has to cross the inner runway. So it was the crossings that really made it a headache. You could only use it for arrivals or for departures, depending on which way the wind was blowing, because you couldn't get the runway. You can couldn't get to the runway from the departure end or the arrival end, depending on which way the the wind was blowing. So you get you're kind of really limited on uh, on your operations there. It was very awkward. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's even worse when you have like a like I said, like a a busy airport where you don't have the extra capacity. The the one that comes to mind that was a well, it was a real challenge for uh, the summer. I think it was 2015. I want to say 2015, somewhere around there. Uh, Newark repaved both of their main runways, two two left and two two right, got repaved during that one summer, and it was quite a thing to see them do it, because man, they got that done in a hurry. It was like three months, and they got two 10,000 foot runways paved, repaved from end to end in like, in one summer. That was impressive. 
Um, it was not easy, though. They just don't have the capacity in Newark to really not have, uh, you know, they have a third runway. They have 1129, but it's very short. So all the heavies were not able to use it. So it really made it awkward. And there's not really any great approaches because of the way it's oriented. There's not a lot of space, especially 29. So uh, what they did for a whole summer was, was basically if you were a light aircraft and you were... And they were using the 22s, which was which is the normal direction. About 70 percent of the time, I think they use the 22s in Newark, and maybe 80 percent. Um, then you were doing the bridge visual to 29, which is a pretty. Uh, it's not a terrible approach by any means, but you're turning final at like 500 feet or less over this railway bridge. Uh, it, it was always a bit of a it was always a bit of a challenging approach. Anyways, it was definitely tight to get to get that one done and then of course heavy aircraft couldn't do that so then they had to so they were using the longer runway for departure but then the heavy aircraft that couldn't circle and land on this short runway then also had to use this long runway for it was a nightmare just just tons and tons of delays and cancellations just due to the, that that runway change like most of these airports they're designed to operate pretty close to capacity some of the, the larger airports have spare capacity uh the ones that come to mind right off right off the bat dfw and denver they have spare capacity they have enough parallel runways and even crossing runways that they can manage departures and arrivals but yeah uh places like that like vancouver was it last year vancouver did uh, rehabilitation on eight left and it was uh it definitely threw a, a wrench in the works for a good part of the uh good part of the summer last year uh, Honolulu has three other runways, but when it gets busy, causes the sequencing because now we land, only land on one runway. Yeah, yeah. Boston's been doing has done some construction projects lately too, and Boston's another one where yeah, you take one runway offline, and it really kind of throws the whole situation off. They figured out how to run the air the uh, operation very efficiently with one runway, but uh, or with, with the two runways. But you take one runway offline, you kind of throw the whole thing out the window. Looks like we have a departure. Uh, let's see here, Gar. Oh, I just had a thought too, huh? Yeah. I just had a thought. Okay, let's do let's do this first. So, I'm just give them the Vancouver two off of eight uh, right. There it is. I just had a very interesting thought. Yeah, gear will work. Okay. Um, oops, somebody's flying BFR around. Oh, it looks like he's out of Bellingham, maybe. Um, yeah, I was going to say, like, I was supposed to fly, I was supposed to work for across the pond just for the first couple of hours of the uh, American side, uh, of the uh, North American side here. And then, uh, yeah, I just realized that I've been, I've had uh, some stuff cancel. I had my day off actually pushed from Friday to Saturday. That actually might be an advantage. Because I was only going to be available for across the pond for, like, the first, maybe hour or so of arrivals and then I was going to have to bail for work. But now I'm required to have a day off on Saturday. Oh, that just changed the whole equation. That just changed the whole equation. Oh, oh. well, didn't even think about that. I was kind of ticked off. I was really honestly ticked off. CP, CTP is a national. Yeah, except for the fact that they had on April 1st, which, okay, first of all, it's April Fool's Day, which is a terrible thing, terrible day to have an event yeah. like this. Hello. <laughs> but, uh, no, um, yeah, it's a terrible day to have an event, but to have the event in the first, like, one, two, three days of the month is not a good idea because uh, what I ended up with was I ended up with a carry-out pairing that actually starts technically in March and then carries out into April. And so uh, I did not even conceive. Somebody uh, call in Vancouver Center there? But yeah, I, so I did not even con conceive of, of of cross the pond being a thing in in when I, when in February when we were bidding for that schedule. So, yeah, it, uh, yeah, I, I think bidding nah, booking cross the pond for the first couple of days of the month is not a good idea, considering the number of uh, uh, people who do shift work. Uh, locking locking that day off in that far in advance can sometimes be a bit of a challenge. Anyways. I mean, it is what it is. I'll, I'll, but uh, my my situation may have changed, so may, I may actually have to 
I may actually be able to work for the entire duration of Cross the Bond on that uh, Saturday, which would be great. be wonderful. Because uh, I missed Cross the Pond this past fall for the first time in like, I, I want to say like seven or eight years, I did not participate in Cross the Pond this past fall. I just simply, uh, I, I couldn't. I was obligated for work. It was not something I could even book for a day off because it's training, which is all pre-scheduled and can't be moved around. And uh <laughs> Yeah, uh, so yeah, this for this past fall, fall of 2022, for the first time in I, I, possibly 10 years, I did not participate in Cross the Pond in any way, shape, or form because I had to work. I had to go to training, couldn't couldn't participate. I was disappointed. I was very disappointed when I realized that, but I mean, it is what it is. I mean, training comes around pretty, doesn't come around too often anyways. Not uh, not initial training doesn't come around too often anyways. So I was disappointed, but it is what it is. And now, uh, hmm. yeah, I may just be able to deal with that anyways, so... Let's just switch to this ground view here. Nope. Okay. American 221. Just want to make sure he's not moving. Wouldn't be the first guy to start moving. Nice. Smart. All right. Well, we got one guy. Let's see if we can lure in some more. We got one person on the ground in Victoria, no flight plan. We got American here on the ground in Vancouver, flight plan, but doesn't call it yet. <laughs> American 26 is coming, KLM 619 is coming. Yeah, we got a couple of arrivals looking like they're coming right after midnight Zulu. I mean, I might stick around for that. This WestJet that's leaving from Montreal to come to Vancouver, I'm not sticking around for that. That is way too far out there, and that would be an epic marathon session, and especially streaming. The other thing about streaming, too, is, of course, you want to chat the whole time, even when you're not controlling. You want to kind of talk and, and keep this stream somewhat engaging. That wears on the voice. That wears on the voice a lot. Oh, I am hungry, though. Or, I mean, I'm stuffed. I had a really big lunch. Stuff like two slices of deep dish pizza to really kind of just stuff you right to the brim. I don't even want to drink my coffee except I know I need I, I know I need my caffeine fix for the afternoon. Oh well. Yeah, so anyways, for those of you that are subscribers, members on uh, on my channels here, FS2 Crew's the cu custom voice pack for FS2 Crew is coming. Starting with the 737, I did I did all the recordings for the 737, which is the largest one. Actually, I was shocked when I started doing it. There's over, there's uh, almost 800 separate recordings in uh, the FS2 Crew data folder for uh, for the 737. Some of the other ones are a little bit smaller, but the 737 is a very big voice pack. There's a lot of voice commands. There's a lot of SOPs. Um, it's a huge package, so it's some it's it's over 800 voice clips. Took me a good couple of hours to record it yesterday, uh, and I have to go back and I have to listen to it and make sure that they all kind of fit together nicely. Especially like you're doing like the numbers, you have to kind of say them in a very consistent tone so it doesn't sound weird when the numbers are all run together. It's not, uh, you know, it's not up and down. It's got to be very, very consistent. But yeah, that's it's, I, I've been trying to think of that for a while now. I've been like, what can what can I offer to my members, uh, like the the paying subscribers, uh, you know, to to thank them. You know, a little something, a little bonus. So I thought that was, I don't know where I even got the idea from, but uh, I've been kind of toying with it for a while, for a while actually, for the idea of just recording an FS2 crew voice pack. I thought, you know, just just the more the more the merrier. The more voice packs, the merrier. And FS2 crew's slowly been building up their repertoire. Anyone can go out there and record a voice pack. Um, you got to, it's got to take some time, some patience. You got to have a good plot, a good spot to do it because you kind of want to do it all in one session. You want to make sure whatever reverb, background noise, anything you got on there is consistent across all the voice files. So you want to kind of do it in one session. It's a lot of voice files. Like I said, it's about 800 voice files. It took me a couple hours to uh, record all those, but I got, I just got to listen to them all. Make sure, make sure they all kind of work together that, that, that there's not too much dead space at the start or any end of any of the files and it all kind of works together but can't do that until i get the sim fired up so uh, one of these days i'll fire up the sim and go flying with myself <laughs> but fs2 crew has been slowly increasing the repertoire they're they're up to a good like dozen dozen and a half different voice packs now so people have you know they they will 
include your voice pack if you, if you uh, if you submit it to them. So you can submit you can submit a voice pack to FS2 Crew for inclusion in future versions of their software, and uh, they'll give it a listen through. They'll make sure that all the files uh, kind of meet the requirements. There's nothing nothing uh, untoward in any of the files, and then they'll inclu they'll in include it in the final package. So there's been a slowly but steadily increasing number of packages. Which is just kind of nice to see. So uh, it, it just as the immersion. You know, the last couple of times I've flown with uh, I've flown with the New Zealand voice at voice pack. But uh, you know, if you change it up every single time, it, it's actually kind of nice because it really it feels like you're flying with different people, which is what the airlines really are all about. I mean, it's not what they're all about, but it's that that that's your reality when you fly with an airline. Almost every single trip you go, you're going to be flying with somebody different. You might fly a couple of legs with the same guy on a trip, and then the next trip it's going to be somebody completely different. So you changing that up it's kind of it's it's fun and it used to be there were only like two or three voice packs and then just slowly over time more and more people have been added i guess more and more people have kind of gone through the effort it's it's not a small process to go and do all those recordings definitely not but uh could be very worth very worthwhile in the end so i got this eastern airlines american and i got the air canada 26 here air canada 26 heavy vancouver you back yet no, he's not back yet. It's all good. I know what he's doing. I know where he came from. And I know and I know he's away. I told him he could step away for whatever time he needed. So whenever he gets back, it's on the scope here. Yeah, Honolulu, if you're a controller in Honolulu, if you're talking about it, like there's a bunch of traffic kind of going on down there in Honolulu, so might be a good time to log on. I see a bunch of a uh, couple of walkers going in there. There's a little bit of traffic in and out, anyways. It's it, like there's so many places I would love to guest control, but there's a limit to how much you can do as well. I've never guest guest controlled in the states. The I, I guest control everywhere in Canada. I've never guest controlled in the states, and I think I've pretty much stretched to my limit. Air Canada two six heavy, Air Canada, heavy uh, Vancouver. Thanks, uh, Squawk Dead. Then just confirm at uh, flight level three seven zero. Yeah, okay, two six heavy, perfect. Thank you very much. You're identified. Flight level three seven zero. Welcome. Appreciate it. <laughs> Someone say Honolulu. <laughs> there you go. Uh, it's a small world here on Vatsim. <laughs> I like it. Someone say Honolulu. Uh, but it's always growing too. Uh, that's that's another thing that uh, I. I I was on last night as well for a short period of time in the evening. I was a little bit bored and just thought eh, I'll just log a couple of hours. It was kind of quiet on uh, Edmonton last night, but uh, I did. There was one guy who did a flight from uh, Edmonton, went up to uh, Fort McMurray in the in the Dash Eight, and uh, he landed in Fort McMurray. And then he sent me a couple messages, said thanks. That was my second flight on the Vatsim network. I appreciate all the all the help and the service. I'm like, I, like I would not have known. It was the second flight on the network to 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 hear him fly it because he sounded like he knew what he was doing. He flew the whole thing the way he was supposed to. Pfft, didn't see any issues. So, um, you know, sometimes it just takes a question of building up that confidence too to get online. There's not enough. Uh, it, 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 no, I should I should rephrase it. There, there's it, it can be very intimidating to fly on Batson. We're we're a network that definitely. Um, we pride ourselves on trying to be as professional as we are all personally able. And I, I like that. I, I like a network where everyone kind of aspires to be their best. In this world where people are just, I don't know, it seems like a lot of people don't put in a lot of effort. They just try to coast by with as little as possible. Uh, Vatsim is an effort that it, it, it doesn't necessarily reward doing, the, doing your best, but it, there's there's just personal satisfaction from doing your best, from knowing you did your best with whatever you got. Um, it, flying is very much like that in, in a lot of ways. Like you can you can commit as little or as much as you want, but uh, you know you really at the end of the day when you're flying you want to commit as much as as much as you can, as much as you're able, and and, and then some because you don't want to be on the wrong side of anything in flying. You don't want to be on the wrong side of the mountain. You don't want to be on the wrong side of the weather. You want to make sure you've kind of looked ahead, considered all the possibilities, and are ready to take some reasonable course of action. Vancouver Center, American 221 on the ground. Vancouver, gate Charlie 18, I'm sorry, gate 18 with information. Charlie looking for IFR clearance to Yellowknife. 
American 221 Vancouver, good afternoon. You're clear to the Yellowknife Airport via the Vancouver 2 departure and uh, vectors to your flight plan route. Depart runway 08 right, squawk code 0772. Okay, sir, clear to Yellowknife, uh, Vancouver 2 departure, radar vectors as the flight plan. Uh, we will expect runway 8 right and squawk 0772. American 221. American 221, thank you. The readback is correct. Information uh, Charlie is current in Vancouver. And uh, push back and start at your discretion. Call ready for taxi. I do have information, Charlie. Uh, push and start at my discretion. We'll call for taxi. American 221, thank you. Cool. Yeah. And it, it's it's funny, but aviation does tend to try to bring out, for the most part, the best in people. Some people get lazy. Some people just think that's them to goof off. And usually those people don't last very long on the network. They just get chastised and or ignored. And when people get, you know, immature people get ignored, they just eventually stop hanging out. Which is probably a good thing for the rest of us. <laughs> the rest of us that take it seriously. But But there's lots of people who are not good at it but are willing to learn and that's 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 the thing that that that's all you can ask you know we're not all going to be perfect all the time all you can ask is that people do their best to try and improve and learn and that's that's all i ask of people you know people are going to make mistakes and i see the same mistakes over and over again um you know new people always making the same mistakes watching must be watching the same youtube videos to learn how to fly these airplanes because they're all, <laughs> all making the same mistakes but hopefully they learn from them Certainly, that's what I, that's what I hope, anyways. Never noticed there are three wind sources here in Vancouver. There's a south field, runway eight left, runway two six right. <laughs> Never noticed that before. Oh, we got a second flight plan filed here, and I almost knocked over my coffee. That would have been terrible. All right, he's going from Victoria down to Portland. 230, that sounds fine. All right, uh, so we're going to put him on Victoria 5, off 09. 763 in the squawk, that looks good. So you can start to see that KLM coming in from the northeast there as well. And that's all I got right now for arrivals, I think, for a while. Uh, da, 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 da. Yep. Oh, I got another one. Uh, oh, the Jazz. No, same one, sorry, but the Jazz is uh, must be making good time because he's cut like 20 something minutes off his flight. So he's going to be there, going to be here before midnight Zulu. West just still hasn't departed Montreal. Not waiting for that guy. <laughs> Definitely way too far out for me. All right. Put myself there. All right, so this is the KLM right here. What's his flight plan say here? He is direct to booth from wherever he is right now. He back uniform direct booth. Did he come from Amsterdam? Yes, he did. Amsterdam. Well, it looks like you're getting more love in uh, Honolulu than I'm getting up in uh, Vancouver, though. <laughs> ah, you just gotta be patient sometimes. And Toronto's got more departures on the ground than I have, and there's nobody even controlling there. <laughs> Dang it. I thought about doing Toronto. I was actually my first plan was to do Toronto and somebody was logged on when I 
showed up. So I was like, okay, I'll pick somewhere else. And I like Vancouver a lot, but Vancouver is hit or miss sometimes. Sometimes it's nice, lots of stuff kind of going on, and then sometimes it's just super quiet if you catch it on the wrong day and nobody's really thought about Vancouver that day, which is funny too because like Vancouver is the second most popular FIR for controllers in Canada, right behind Toronto. Um, keeping track of the weekly stats all so far this year and it's generally Toronto's come out on top in a lot of the, the categories uh, or not, not, I shouldn't say that. Toronto's come out on top on the center category. Vancouver's been a very strong second um, and then Vancouver's actually rocking the uh, local and terminal categories more than anybody else. Toronto's coming in second or third in those. So it, it, between Toronto and Vancouver, they are the two most um, staffed FIRs in Canada. Still not learning the traffic though. Ah, uh, well, what are we going to do? I'm glad I inspired you to log some hours in control, at least in Honolulu. <laughs> Someone's getting some fat, some ATC at least, even if it's not uh, any airplanes in my space. Okay, complain. I got one airplane. I got two airplanes. I got three airplanes. I got one in the air, two on the ground. About to have a second one in the air. It's not going to be busy, but it'll be... At least some stuff going on. It's better than nothing. I feel like I should get one of those music background music background uh, soundtracks going on when I'm controlling, just to sort of fill the voids when there's nothing going on. It'd be easier than me trying to talk through it all. Yeah, I lost my Eastern Airlines there. Ah, uh, what else was I gonna say though? What other what other things have come down the pipe recently? Um, PMDG has talked about uh, their EFB. Uh, they're still in the beta testing phase with their EFB for the 737, but it's coming along apparently. They've, they've recently validated all the performance data for it, which is great. That I think is one of the, that is really what I'm waiting for with the PMDG EFB is the is the performance data, being able to crunch uh, accurate, realistic numbers for takeoff and landing. That's what I am looking for. So I'm uh, yeah, that is the one I definitely want the most. All right, that, that's definitely the reason I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that EFB the most. I need a longer cord to charge this. I realize my tablet is kind of half dead here, so I'm just going to try and plug it in so it doesn't die completely during the stream. With my super ooper duper long cord, because the short one is just a little bit too short to do uh, what I need to do here. So let's see if I can do this without obstructing the camera for more than about a second here. Plug this into my charging port here and hopefully this is enough to at least make sure it doesn't go any further down the charge even if it doesn't charge there we go oh why did i tag up that guy i wasn't supposed to tag this guy up and i do see one guy crossing my airspace here or is he no and at least cross it oh yeah well maybe he's gonna climb from somewhere who is this guy who's this guy this guy, where's he going? He's going to Friday Harbor. Why does everyone go to Friday Harbor? Come to Vancouver, man. Get some ATC. Friday Harbor. Puh. 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 <laughs> oh, there's nothing wrong with Friday Harbor. I'm just jealous. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to PMDG's tablet. I think that's, to me, the performance data is the biggest thing. Uh, I feel, I feel weird 
doing takeoffs and landings without really properly crunching performance numbers. And I mean, you get the performance numbers in a way from the from the FMS. So you get the speeds and everything in the FMS, and especially with the takeoff, that should account for um, you know your balance field length and everything else like that. Um, but especially for landing, not calculating a landing distance and just sort of taking it for granted. Well, it's a long runway. It's 737. I should be able to land there. Not going through that formal step. It feels very awkward, especially because my my, my pilot life streams are so focused on uh, trying to provide the most realistic experience. Like I've taken now to tuning in guard frequency, doing regular position checks, doing RVSM checks. I'm, I'm trying to take like just everything up a notch and make sure everything is as realistic as I can make it, um, you know, within reason. But uh Oh, the, one of the few things I, uh, one of the things I don't do very well is I don't respect. And Vancouver Center American Two Twenty One push back from the gate, ready to taxi zero eight right. American Two Twenty One Vancouver runway zero eight right. The information is Charlie altimeter two nine or eight five taxi, uh, Gulf Hotel Lima cross runway one three. Okay, we do have information, Charlie, and we're going to 8 right, Golf Hotel Lima and crossing runway 13, American 221. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's one, that's one of the few things that's like, it's, it's really bugging me is, is, is the, the fact that I can't do landing calculations and see how close it is, see what the appropriate auto brake setting is, see if there is an appropriate auto brake setting, or maybe I should be, uh, maybe I should be focusing on uh, auto manual braking landing, you know. But uh, just not even crunching those numbers before I land just feels odd and awkward. But I haven't been able to find, uh, I guess Topcat is still out there. But other than that, Topcat, I have not been able to find any good takeoff and landing performance calculators for the 737. So it is what it is. It's just annoying. I, I would like to see something better. And so it, apparently it's getting close. Uh, they say that they've, they've been, it's been testing for a while. And as far as I can tell, all the performance data is coming out correctly now. Whatever parameters get put in, it is spitting out the correct performance data, which is good. KLM two one nine Vancouver, are you here? Um, KLM <laughs> and KLM two one nine are yet. Yeah. Uh, squawk, uh, squawk a new code for me, please. Zero seven one six and say your altitude. Okay, squawk zero seven one six and flight level three eight zero. KLM219, thank you very much. Identified flight level 380. Welcome. I could even hear my little ping in the background just as he started to talk there. So I was, <laughs> I was a dick. I was just a little bit too fast on it. A little bit too, uh, a little bit too quick on the trigger there. I didn't think he ought to be on frequency. I'm, I'm, I'm so used to most of that. Some people are not on frequency until you ping them. Most people are not good about being proactive and calling before they enter your airspace. So I'm used to that. So that's, that's kind of what I expect of everybody. So then when somebody actually is ready to go and you call up and they're like, oh yeah, I'm on your frequency. I'm just waiting to enter your space. I'm like, holy crap. Holy crow. I, I can't believe somebody is actually listening. So the other thing that uh, also went hand in hand with PMTG's announcement this week was also, or their, their discussion or whatever, was that uh, apparently the 777 for MSFS is about to enter a beta test phase, which... You know, consider they've only just kind of finished with a 37. Really seems like uh, a pretty quick progress at this point. I think maybe the 37 was really where they kind of, they really had to work out all the kinks of how the whole thing's going to come onto the new system. But it sounds like the 777 is actually not all that far from uh, from release. Like, I'm not saying it's going to be released in the next month or so, but like, if they're thinking about putting it into some early beta testing at this point, you're probably talking about a release sometime this year, hopefully. Uh, it'd be nice to get a really good long hauler between that and the 330. The race is on to get a good long hauler into the sim. The biggest thing that the long haulers need and is missing from missing from a, quite a few aircraft in the sim is they really need that pause at top of descent uh, option. It's such a useful option when you're doing long hauling because oftentimes, like when you do long haul in the sim, you can't be there for the whole thing. So you, you plan on doing other things and come back and hope that it's at the top descent point. Um, I often used to, I often used to just set the plane flights to go to Europe and just go to bed sometimes, and just wake up in the morning. It'd be pause, top of descent. I'd be, I wouldn't be connected to the network while I was away, but I'd pause, get back, it's pause, top of descent, unpause it, 
start setting up the descent, log in, boom, do the arrival into London or, or Paris or wherever. I haven't really done a whole lot of long hauling in MSFS, but the, the flip side of that too is that like I still feel like MSFS has memory leaks because I find the longer that the longer it runs, the worse it runs. It, it, it it's usually okay for two to three hours, maybe a little more, but then once you get past about the three to four hour mark, you really start to notice some performance degradations. And it's not there right away. It's usually uh, because you're in cruise for so long and cruise is relatively easy on the uh, on the frames and everything else, you don't really notice it so much. But when you start to come down towards the airport after a long flight and you start to get into the more detailed scenery and more stuff's being drawn on the screen, you start to notice your, your frames really start to drag. So I'm not sure if long hauling is gonna be a practical thing yet. American 221 Vancouver, contact me once you're airborne. The wind 090 zero, nine, zero, 17, gust 25, clear for takeoff, runway 08 right. Clear for takeoff, 8 right, we'll contact you, airborne American 221. Thank you. Yeah. I look forward to the 777. It'd be, it'd be fun having a, a, a big aircraft, a long hauler, a, heavy, a, a good heavy aircraft in the sim. But I'm not really sure... Uh, how practical it's going to be just for me because I, I, and maybe it's just my maybe it's just my computer or something but i just find like the, the sim does not run well after five or six hours. that be said I've, i managed to do it occasionally I, I remember there was a day where i did like three consecutive flights in the phoenix or maybe it was four and like it was like eight hours of flying I, I can't remember exactly what i did but it was like i just did like one flight and then i sort of added another flight to it i think i did like a what did I do? I can't even remember what I did. I think I did like a Halifax, Montreal, then I did Montreal, Toronto, and then I like did Montreal, then I did Toronto, like LAX or something like that. Like I did like one continuous flight, didn't pause the sim, didn't go out to the main menu and reload everything, like reset the aircraft and set up for another departure, you know, one continuous session. I don't do that very often, especially, I mean, it ended up being like an eight or nine hour day and the, the performance is not bad actually after that long, but I just do find like if it's been running for a while, when you come back to arrive again, the scenery does not load well. It doesn't ever seem to quite run at the uh, the the pace it does when you first load it. Maybe Sim Update Twelve will fix some of those things. I don't know. It's possible. There's also been some other really interesting stuff coming out. The uh, they, There have been some uh, previews of the ATR now, I guess, and some of the uh, avionics with the with the ATR that's being released by Asobo. Um, I can't think of the gentleman's name. He's the, the same guy who did the CRJ for Aerosoft is doing the uh, ATR for Asobo, but uh, it's got to be a payware add-on. It's going to be, uh, it sounds like it's going to be similar level to the Aerosoft CRJ where it's um, it's got pretty realistic scripting, but it's not to the point where you're going to have in-depph system failures, which again, I, I, I disappoint. And I, it's funny because I read this, um, I, I, I read this kind of uh, discussion over, you know, who wants to simulate failures in airplanes? It's just good to just fly them. And it's like, yes, but no. Some people do want to simulate failures in airplanes. And Vancouver Center, America 221 is airborne off runway 08 right, crossing through 1,400 feet on the flight plan. America 2218 identified, uh, climb 16000 and continue flying runway heading. Fly runway heading up to 16000, American 221, thank you. Um, ah, lost my train of thought there. <laughs> I hate that. I'm having a great train of thought. Stupid airplanes disturb me. <laughs> Um, oh, I've totally lost my train of thought. I was talking about the, the the memory leaks and everything. Ah, I was having a great train of thought. I totally lost it now. Oh well, it'll come back to me in a second. Here, I'm just gonna think, just kind of try and think through what I was talking about before.
uh, oh yeah, we, yes, that's what I was talking about. The, the, there was this discussion going on about you know whether or not simulating failures is really a realistic thing to do in a flight simulator because in a real world things don't fail that often. And you know what? It's absolutely true. Things do not fail that often, but they do fail from time to time. Um, like for me personally, like I, I really enjoy the idea of of flying failures, trying to manage the failure as best I can. I really uh, that that is my one of my favorite things to do. American twenty two eighteen turn left heading zero three zero. Zero three zero left American two twenty one. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I said that there. Um. Yeah, I, and I get the people who just want to fly the airplane. They don't want anything to fail. And that's fine, but there's there's lots of people out there who want something to fail. That like flying an airplane is is, is entertaining, but um, you know, and there's a certain sense of accomplishment just from getting the airplane fired up and, and and working on a normal day because there's a lot of stuff sometimes to do. They look at the seven thirty seven, and it's an incredibly long startup process, very long, very interesting, but. After a certain point in time, you're going to start to run out of. I think that, that 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 starts to get a little bit boring after a little while. And the idea that there's a little bit of jeopardy to it as well. Like if if it, you know if you, if you have a, a an airplane without failure simulations, if you do something wrong, it doesn't really affect anything. But if you do have the failure simulations, if you do something wrong, and you know everybody's human, they will at some point. <sighs> There's a there's fallout to your to your decisions to your actions, and and I, I don't know, I just I, I I find it very interesting and compelling trying to deal with that and and realize that sometimes it's the the, the result of my own actions. American two twenty one proceed direct Gary on course. Direct Gary on course American two twenty one thank you. Really, really Eastern Airlines, you son of a gun. He was on the ground in Victoria, decided to disconnect for the departure and reconnect as soon as he got. Oh, what a little tool. When he thought he was out of my airspace, but he's not. Oh, that bugs me. <laughs> Why log on to this network at all if you don't want to deal with controllers? Wow, that bugs me. Ah, uh, anywho. Ah, stupid buttons. American 221, continue climb, flight level 330. Up to 330, American 221, thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Anyways. I, I I much prefer a simulation that allows for failures, allows things to go wrong. Again, it, it, it reiterates that doing the right process is important, not just for the sake of the process, but for the sake of what can happen if you do the process incorrectly, and then the idea of managing it. So the perfect example um, happened like three streams ago or something when we were going from Guadalajara, or sorry, we were going from LAX down to Guadalajara in the 737 uh, with FS2 crew and everything live on stream. And... Uh, what ended up happening, of course, was th through about, I think it was about 18,000 feet, give or take, um, we suddenly had a cabin pressurization light. And a uh, little bit of troubleshooting, and what, what had happened was that I had not turned the packs on. So the packs were the packs were off for takeoff. Were the packs off for takeoff? The packs must have been off for takeoff. I can't even remember now. I think the packs were off for takeoff. Although why, I'm not even really sure. But the FO never turned the packs on. So I relied on him because that was his flow. Uh, and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, like, I'm, I'm uh, as the captain, I, I should have been on this and I should have been watching it. I, and I just didn't realize that FS2 crew could make mistakes, which I find funny to, for myself to even say that because I know FS2 crew can make mistakes. I know that it's not a, a, a foolproof system. I know it's got, it can have errors. It can have scripting glitches, etc. cetera. But, uh, yeah, so the packs did not come on. And, uh, of course, we carried on hunky-dory. I kind of, and I did notice it at 10,000 feet. That's probably the part I kicked myself for, was I kind of noticed at 10,000 feet that the pressurization looked a little off. It looked like the cabin was climbing a little bit high. The differential was a little bit high. Um, 
I thought, hmm, that's kind of odd. It seems like it's a little higher than it should be, but I thought maybe, yeah, it's, you know, after PAX off takeoff or whatever, it was within limits. For whatever reason, I thought, uh, I, I sort of looked at it, it's like, it seems like it's under control. It's not great, but it seems like it's under control. So I didn't think too much about it. And then, of course, we get to 18,000 feet, and then we get the cabin pressurization light because the cabin exceeded 9,800 feet, and boom, comes on, gives you a red light, and I'm looking at it, I'm like, and I look up at the, uh, the PAX, and sure enough, they're still off. So I reached over, turned them on. I started to descent anyways to kind of regain some cabin altitude because it takes a while for the for the packs to repressurize the airplane if the the, the outflow valve or sorry if the airplane is completely depressurized. It's going to take a few minutes for the packs to pressurize the airplane and bring the cabin altitude down again. So it was controlled, but it took a little while to kind of get it back under control. But that is a perfect example of something where there was a failure of the process, and as a result. There was a there was an emergency. There was a situation that happened as a result of the failure of the process. Uh, as much as I was kind of kicking myself because I'm like, oh, that's a stupid oversight on stream. It happens. It happens in the real world. Um, that you you should catch it even if you miss it. You should catch it in the checklist at the after takeoff checklist in the 737. One of them is to make sure the packs are on, bleeds on, packs on. Uh, and the FO, I, I, I requested the FO to do the after takeoff checklist, and he read the whole thing. I, I, I vaguely recall hearing him read it, uh, so he must have checked the packs, but he never actually turned them on. So, you know, checked the packs. I mean, you know, it's, it's a script, obviously. It's a program, so he didn't physically look at them, but uh, it happens to real pilots all the time, too. So we should have caught it. And that's probably the part that I kicked myself the most about, was that we could have caught it if I... Because normally when you're doing a checklist, when, when your partner's doing a checklist, you're usually following along. You're flying the airplane, but you're also looking around just to kind of verify that, yeah, what they're saying is true. You don't want to take them on blind faith that what they said is correct. So it was such a great example of, of, of how a really great in-depth simulation can go awry if you don't follow the procedures correctly. I, 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 I loved it. Like, I, I learned from that lesson. And I, you know, I will say that that's happened in real life before. I, I've, I've, I've been there on a flight where the packs were not turned on at the proper time and due to distraction or whatever else causes a cabin cabin altitude issue sometime after you get above 10,000 feet. Um, it's not the end of the world. You turn the packs on, stuff happens. I've, I've done it, I think I've got to have done it at least twice in my career. Once in, once in one of the charter planes I flew, and then again uh, again in the dash, it, it happened once. Um, we did packs off, take off fairly regularly in the dash, but um, in this case, we were departing a busy American airport, and it was, uh, we just simply... It, it just a case of distraction. So much going on right after departure, vectors and climbs and cleaning up the aircraft and everything else, and the packs never went back on. Didn't realize that we were well above 10,000 feet and we got the altitude alert. And that's one of the reasons why it's there and you can think about it, but it was just, it, yeah, I, I, this is why I like like having a, a very realistic in-depth simulation. That's why I like the Phoenix, I like the PMDG, I like these very realistic simulations. Now this is going to be a little bit of a conflict up here. How close are these guys going to get here? Yeah, they're going to pass about 18 miles apart. It's not that much of an issue. How far we got to go here? We are 186 miles. KLM 219 or Vancouver. Arrival information is Charlie. Runway 08 left for arrival. Information Charlie. Runway 08 left. KLM 219. KLM 219er, that is correct. When ready, descend flight level 290. Um, when ready, descend flight level 290, KLM 219er. This guy's just a little bit further, but not that much further. Yeah, he's 270 miles. It's not quite an even skew. All right, let's start doing some work again here. Yeah, it all came from people complaining that, oh, we don't need realistic airplanes because we don't want stuff, to, I don't want stuff to fail. I'm like, yeah, okay, not everyone does. Some people just want to go up there and fly, but at the end of the day, no no jeopardy, where's the, where's the challenge? So I personally like to see stuff fail, and I think you guys know that about me. If you've watched my channels for any length of time, I really enjoy it because I enjoy seeing it because that's when you really kind of take the measure of a pilot. It's not how well can you fly when everything's perfect. It's how well can you fly when things are not perfect. How well can you manage the situation and Really, at the end of the day, now for pilots, it's, it's about management. Hello, WestJet one six zero on the ground of Vancouver with information Charlie for clearance to Edmonton. Well, WestJet one sixty uh, Vancouver. Good uh, afternoon. Cleared to Edmonton. Vancouver two departure. Flight plan route. Depart runway zero eight right. Squawk zero seven zero five.
All right, WestJet 160 is cleared. Vancouver 2 departure. Flight plan route off of 08 right and squawk 0705. WestJet 160, thanks. That read back is correct. Uh, information Charlie's current. Push and start at your discretion. Call ready for taxi. Yeah, we got Charlie. We'll call for taxi for WestJet 160. Thanks. Yeah, I know it's not for everybody. I know some people just want to want to use the sim for fun and exploring and flying, and, I, and that's fine, and I get that, but definitely don't criticize those that do enjoy. Yes, okay, in the real world, things don't fail every single day, but things do fail on a very regular basis. Most people don't know how often things fail in an airplane because most of the time, the redundancy of the systems carries you through the day, and you just it does. it's not a big issue. Um, just last week, I had the windshield heat fail. It's not a big deal. You got two windshields. I had the windshield heat on one half fail. The other half still worked. No big deal. Wasn't a Cat 2 kind of day. Wasn't really any icing. It really didn't have an impact on the operation, but something failed. Uh, you know, stuff fails with some regularity in this business, and most of the time you don't even realize it because the redundancy in the systems, uh, you know, carries you through the day. You don't have to... You don't have to panic. You're not, uh, you know, you don't have to divert to some other airport most of the time because most of the time it's VFR. Most of the time it's it, it's a non-issue. But every once in a while, something's going to happen that 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 caused a pretty serious issue. Um, it actually happened just uh, two, three weeks ago. Uh, my father was on a my father was on a flight, and uh, I, I I said, "Hey, enjoy your flight," and uh, and uh, then I sent him a text actually after he'd uh, after they'd uh, left the gate. And then and actually just said, I think that was when I texted him and just said, enjoy your flight. And then like 20 minutes later, I got a text back from him. Like, and he's like, we're back. I'm like, what? And it's like, yeah, well, it turns out that we had, there was an issue with uh, one of the cargo doors showing open on the aircraft. So they had to circle back and land uh, land at the origin again. Um, you know, so they were in the air for maybe 20 something minutes. And then they had to go back, go back to the gate, get it dealt with, end up getting another whole airplane brought in to do the flight. So, it, you know. It, it happens from time to time. So don't say stuff doesn't happen in aviation. You, you, most people don't know how often stuff actually happens because most of the time it's benign, but it does happen. And it's just about dealing with it, you know, and, and, and when things do happen that might possibly impact your operation down the road, making those choices, making those decisions that are going to, um, you know, try and have the most favorable outcome. Do you continue to your destination when the weather's kind of marginal if you've lost a, a generator uh, or do you divert to an alternate? You know, do you have a you have a fuel issue, or you've had some delays? You know, and then you know you've had delays due to ATC or de-ice, and all of a sudden your fuel's getting really tight, and then one more thing goes wrong. You don't get a you don't get a climb, or you get a long vector off course, or something, and all of a sudden now you're dealing with okay, do we have enough fuel? Do we continue with our destination? Do we divert to the alternate? It's not always an easy choice either, because diverting to the alternate is a very expensive option for an airline. It's not something most pilots want to do. Pilots are extremely goal oriented. They want to get somewhere, but they want to get there safely. So. Um, you know, years ago, it was diverting because because of a little bit of weather. Never happened because the airlines just packed on gobs of extra gas. Um, over time, it has slowly shifted, and, and airlines do not pack on nearly as much gas as, as you know. Margins have gotten tighter. Efficient. The name of efficiency has gotten. Uh, you know, the game of efficiency has gotten ever more, ever stronger. People, airlines really kind of need to make every dollar count. There's not as much fuel being carried around for contingencies. Don't get me wrong, there's a legal requirement, there's a legal minimum, and it's always being met, but the legal requirement's not particularly high. You've got to have enough fuel to go to your alternate, and then you've also got to have like a 5% extra buffer. 5%, depending on the length of your flight, could be just a handful of minutes. Maybe not even that much. Um, so you do one go around, all of a sudden now you're 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 in a bind. You you don't have enough. You you have maybe enough to go to your alternate. So do you come back and do do another approach? Was the go around because somebody didn't get off the runway fast enough in front of you? Are you are you going to land for sure, or is it because you know you couldn't see anything at minimums? And so probably if we come back and do this again, it's probably not going to happen either. Um, now all of a sudden we do have to make those choices. So it's not to say that airlines don't put fuel on airplanes. They do, and especially when the weather's kind of dicey, um, they will. But when the weather's really nice, there's not usually a lot of contingency fuel allowed for. The other flip side of that equation, too, is that the airlines have costed this out, and they've looked at it, and they said, how often do we actually really divert? And how long, you know, if we're packing on an extra 10% for fuel or 5% of fuel on every flight, uh, or maybe more, you know, an extra 30 minutes of fuel on every single flight above and beyond the regulatory requirements, and we, div we have diversions end up happening, you know, 
on average, you know, our pilots will divert once every two years. Each pilot might divert once every two years. But for that, we're carrying around 10% extra fuel all the time. And the, 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 the weight, the extra weight, you're burning more fuel just to carry that fuel. Uh, most of the airlines have, have kind of reached that conclusion that if 2% of our flights divert, but we stop carrying around 10% extra fuel, that's more efficient in the long run. Um, and it's not to say, you know, do anything unsafe, but it's just it's just a question of efficiency. Yes, diversions are costly. Uh, extra fuel, extra uh, salaries, um, especially if you run out of duty days and people end up in the wrong city and you've got to reaccommodate passengers, you've got to accommodate passengers with hotels, uh, meal vouchers, reaccommodations on future flights. Yes, a diversion very quickly becomes very costly, but they are so so rare. Most airline, most airports, you're down to a half mile, uh, 200 feet on every ILS, uh, the odds of you diverting most of the time, very low. I can think of in the past, in the past six years, I've diverted twice. Uh, so, you know, and, and both times, like we just simply stopped for gas, kept going. So, you know, those, those diversions, even those two, the diversions that I did in the past uh, six years, very minimal diversions. Like at the end of the day, cost the company something for some extra gas and some extra time, but really, you know, no additional pasture accommodation, things like that, like very minimal impact on the operation, you know. And so I've been starting to look at that too. And I've been saying to myself, like, yeah, like, do we really need to carry around this much extra gas? And I won't hesitate. If the weather looks dicey or there's delays or whatever, I will carry around the extra gas. But some days it's just, yeah, you look at it, you're like, yeah, do we don't need to carry that much extra gas all the time. Okay, at a 26 heavy. Vancouver information is Charlie, runway 08 left for arrival. When ready, descend flight level 290. Air Canada 26 heavy, uh, we're going to descend to flight level 290. Information Charlie, and I'm sure it's about to change any minute, and we're expecting 08 left. Air Canada 26 heavy. Air Canada 26 heavy, that's all correct. The descent to 290 was at your discretion. Well, I've been online for two hours, and so far I've handled about eight airplanes, I think. <laughs> it's getting a little bit busier, and hopefully it will continue to do so. Sit here long enough on VATS, and eventually the people start showing up. <laughs> now I have six inbounds to Vancouver, two of which are already on my scope. Three, Number three and four will arrive... Uh, arrive close to the end of my stream. Pardon me, close to the end of my stream here in 90 minutes. Uh, da, 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 da. And then the other ones are going to be way too late. That guy in Montreal got airborne. He's not going to be here till 222 Zulu. Not sticking around that long. <laughs> not sticking around that long. All right, there we go. Victoria Adis, Prince George Adis. There goes KLM 219. He's in his descent. Hey! <laughs> Phil Dowling 1973. Welcome to the channel. Oh, it's a quiet day in Vancouver, but what are you going to do? It's nice to see you, my friend. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, one of these days. I can't remember if you ever really used the FS2 crew or not, because I was saying that earlier. I finally took to took to recording my FS2 crew uh, voice pack. The Captain Nabs FS2 crew voice pack. It will come eventually here. It'll be a little bit longer. And Air Canada 26 Heavy, you called it. There it is. It's now information Delta in Vancouver with no significant changes. Appreciate it, Air Canada 26 Heavy. Yeah. I'm I'm pretty stoked to kind of go and try that out at home. It'll be kind of weird listening to myself, <laughs> listening to myself talk. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to try this out, and I, I think it's a great little reward. All good things come to those who wait patiently. Apparently, I've been waiting here for about two hours, and this is all the traffic you see here. Oh, I got 
three, four airplanes right now. You got one, got one on the ground here in Vancouver as well. So we got some stuff going on. It's not, uh, it's not completely vacant or anything, but it's a little bit, uh, a little bit quiet. What are you gonna do? It's a what? What day is it? I don't even know what the heck day it is. <laughs> I literally have to look at my computer here in the corner. It's Tuesday. It's Tuesday. Tuesday night. I guess uh, Edmonton will probably be having their weekly thing in a in a in a couple of hours. Fortunately, I gotta I gotta get out of here in a couple of hours. But uh, you know, with any luck, maybe I'll get a couple of uh, Edmonton Vancouver flights. I'm surprised I haven't gotten any in there yet. Been here for about two hours. Usually you get one. I mean, you got, we got one here from uh, Vancouver to Edmonton, so we got one. But usually that's a pretty good flight. That's a that's a pretty nice ideal kind of like flight simulation um, flight, just sort of back and forth. It's a nice length. It's an hour, hour and a half. It's a good stage length for, for flights. And I don't know how some of you guys do these, these five, six, eight, ten, twelve 12 hour flights. Like, my gosh, the commitment there alone. And some people are connected to the network for that long. Like, that blows my mind. Let's have a look here, shall we? Who? Hey, KLM two one nine or continue to send twelve thousand. The Vancouver altimeter two nine or eight three. Can you send twelve thousand altimeter two nine or eight three? All right. Let's see who's been online this the longest. So currently, the longest flight online, uh, Delta ten seventy eight, has been online for seventeen hours and one minute. He flew from uh, Kilimanjaro to Fort Lauderdale. 17 hours and one minute. The next highest guy, 12 hours and seven minutes. Uh, he is en route from Dubai to Sydney. After that, uh, guy's been online for 1147. Sao Paulo to San Francisco, still en route. Uh, this KLM is actually the fourth longest guy on the network here. He's been online for 10 hours and 22 minutes. I wish I 160. We are ready for taxi. We're able Lima 4. WestJet uh, 160, uh, Lima 4 is approved. Runway 08 right uh, information Delta now. Altimeter 2983. Taxi apron at your discretion. Golf Hotel Lima cross runway 13 onto Lima 4. Golf Hotel Lima crossing 13 to Lima 4 short of 08 right. Uh, we have Delta now. Uh, Matter 83 for WestJet 160. Stretch. Air Canada 26 heavy continue to send 12 1 2000. Vancouver altimeter 2983. Yeah, some of these guys, even when I do long flights, I seldom stay connected for the whole time. I uh, much respect to all these guys that can do this, that, that are online for this length of time. Let's see the controllers. Who's been online? The line is online. The longest is a controller. Matt W. over in Boston, Santa. Boston, Santa. He's been online for four hours and 46 minutes. It's a lot more work to be a controller than a pilot in terms of certainly your network connectivity and dealing with people. You've got to be there constantly. You know, I mean, I'm sure that, uh, let's see here, his name is Noredo Roden, uh, Delta 1078, but I'm sure this guy who's online for 17 hours, I don't think he was parked in front of his computer for 17 hours, but when you're a controller, you have to be in front of the computer for that length of time. There's no there's no break. But uh, speaking of break, I think I just need about a two-minute uh, uh, two uh, facility break here, so... Be right back here. And attention all aircraft. Vancouver Center is going to be unmonitored for the next two minutes. I'll be right back, guys.
Attention all aircraft, Vancouver Center is back on frequency. All right, so Kayla. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, WestJet 160, Vancouver. You can contact me once you're airborne. The wind's now 260 at 2. Clear for takeoff, runway 08 right. Clear for takeoff, 08 right. We'll call you airborne to WestJet 160. <laughs> Wow, that wind really swung around. Holy moly. <laughs> it was... Uh, it was gusty out of the east. And now all three runways are showing... Uh, Starting to show a substantial tailwind here. Uh, I think we may have to do a runway change. <sighs> okay, yeah, we're going to do a runway change. KLM 219 Vancouver. Uh, the winds are starting to shift around here now. Uh, right now, uh, one of the wind sensors on the field is showing at 240 at 15 knots now. Uh, did you want to still come around for 08 left, or do you want me to switch you up for 26 right? I can give you a vector to lose some altitude. Hey, I'm two, nine, 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 nine. We'll take whatever the winds are favoring you there. If you don't mind, just section this, KLM 219. Okay, KLM 219 are plan uh, for the ILS runway 26 right. Uh, I'll do this. So fly heading now 170, maintain 12,000, and uh, just get yourself set up for the ILS 26 right. Okay, ILS 26 right, fly heading 170, and we'll maintain 12,000 to KLM 219. Air Canada 26 Heavy, same for you. Uh, we're going to be switching to a West Flow, so plan uh, now the ILS 26 right. Expect 26 right for Air Canada 26 Heavy. At Westshore 160, we're airborne past 1000. WestJet 160, Vancouver, thank you. Identified. Uh, climb 11,000. We'll climb 11,000 for West Show 160. All right, let's just get these guys kind of deconflicted here before I get much of a lower descent. And he's going to Edmonton, so he's got to go off to, yeah. KLM 219er, descend uh, 8,000. All right, and let's see if I can do a, let's see how quickly I can do an ATIS change here as well to get this runway change going. Da, 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 All right, there we go. So let's switch up this as well here. There you go. So I thought Vidri. Westjet 160, turn left, direct Vidri on course, climb 16,000. Left, direct Vidri and climb 16,000 for Westjet 160. KLM 219 Heavy, you have the approach uh, all programmed in now? Hey, Sam, now. Roger, I'll uh, just give you a vector to lose altitude and then uh, we'll get you turned back inbound here in a couple minutes. Roger, KLM 219er, descend 5,000. All right. This guy's still. Yeah, he's getting there. He's getting there. It's gonna be a little bit high now for. Uh, <laughs> it's 
some of these restrictions here, but that's okay. Or a little, yeah, a little bit low, I should say, for some of these restrictions, but that's okay. He's what, 30 miles back? Yeah, that's pretty much 30 miles. KLM 219er, turn right heading 240, descend 3000. Right heading 240, descend 4000, KLM 219er. KLM 219er, very close, it's 3000. 3000, West Jet 160, continue climb, flight level 350. So we'll continue up to 350 for West Jet 160, thanks. Yeah, no, this is a good runway change. So south field, 270 at 5, 8 left, 240 at 13. 26 right, 275. That really kind of swung around. It was gusty out of the east just recently. And that really just swung right around. It's a good thing I have the live RVR up here. Interesting. I should find a way to put the live RVR uh, up on the uh, screen here. I've just got it on my tablet because it's just it's kind of nice as a second screen You can kind of look over it. I can change very quickly without even messing up what's going on on my main screen. I can change the uh, displayed uh, oh, uh, What I try to say the displayed, uh, you know airport on here so I can have multiple airports up Get The dotems going I've really started to enjoy this as a very useful tool All right, we don't need that view anymore May have turned him inbound a little bit too soon here. That's okay. We've got some space here. Uh, let's see. Switch this around here. Two, six, right. As long as I have him down by. Nine point four DME for three thousand puts it yeah, pretty much the river cross in there. Yeah. KLM 219er, turn right, heading 290. Right heading 290, KLM 219er. Perfect, yeah, he got down to plenty of time. I was getting a little little worried, then, yeah, it worked out quite well. 30 miles, 10,000 feet, that should be ideal for anybody to lose that. Especially after flying for... 10, 11 hours, a triple seven is going to have uh, not a whole lot of gas left in it. It's going to be relatively light. Should be able to get down pretty quickly. You would think, you would hope. <laughs> Famous last words, but that's, that's the theory anyways. Well, getting a little bit of interest going on here. Oh. Uh, oh, no, I'm just going to say. KLM 219er, turn right 10 more degrees. Right by 10 degrees, KLM 219er. It's a little bit over where it should be, but that'll help ensure he gets the glide slope. KLM 219er, on that heading, intercept the localizer, cleared the ILS runway 26 right. On this heading, cleared the local, uh, ILS 26 right, KLM 219er. Roger. Sounds like he's getting tired. <laughs> 11 hours of flying will do that to you, especially because we're never augmented in the flight sim network. <laughs> in the real world, no pilot stays in the flight deck for that long. They, they get up, they move around, they go to the bathroom, go get a drink, talk to the flight attendant, something, anything to kind of wake themselves up. Oh, who do we got? We got uh, Edmonton Approaches online now. Oh, I didn't even see that. Nice. He must have just come on because it's not even out there. As I hit refresh, yeah, he literally just logged on. Oh, I got Air North 104 coming in from the north here. 
There he is. Air North 104 coming down to Vancouver. So yeah, we got at least a steady stream of airplanes for the next little while. I'm gonna I my personal plan is about ninety more minutes here. Pretty much at midnight Zulu. That's when I'm gonna head out. So if any of you guys are thinking about flying, you wanna fly in, do some flying. Get some fantastic top-notch ATC here in Vancouver. Uh, you got about you got about 90 minutes to do it. So get logged on soon. At this point, you should probably be thinking more about an outbound than an inbound because it's time's going to go pretty quickly here. I'm actually surprised already that I've been online for two and a half hours. It's for considering it's been very quiet. That two and a half hours has gone by pretty quickly. There he goes. Good stuff. Good stuff. This guy's on the arrival. And uh, maybe I can shortcut him in here. Air Canada 26 Heavy. Proceed direct cease. Charlie Echo Echo Sierra Echo. Proceed direct cease for Air Canada 26 Heavy. Might as well shortcut him in here a little bit. Well, Westjet 160 is going to look like a smart guy. He's going to have the ATC for his arrival as well. <laughs> All right, doesn't look like this FAF has changed. Still totem. Still totem. Just trying, you know, since he's low already, he got low sooner than he should have. And it's, it's totally understandable. Nobody's fault. The, the wind's just shifted, and he's got to do a different runway. It's fine. It's not a big deal. Just happens. So might as well get him some shortcuts in here, see if I can get him in and down a little sooner here. I might give him another shortcut after C's and cut the cut the next corner as well. KLM two one nine er Vancouver winds two six zero at eleven, clear to land, runway two six right. Two six right, clear to land, KLM two one nine. Good times. All in all, that was actually kind of a good good runway change because it wasn't too busy. It really wasn't too much effort. Just just having to look down here and it's all kind of shifting. I should check the other airports as well and see if they're shifting at all. Victoria. Uh, Victoria, Victoria. No, Victoria's still it's still the northeast. 0013. Kelowna. 310 at 21. Nope, still favoring 34. And Prince George, 360 at 7. Nope, still favoring. Okay. Worth a check because that was a it was a pretty quick runway uh, runway shift there wind shift so you never know. Wonder if that was in the forecast. Pull up the TAF here on my phone and see if that happened as was planned or if that was kind of a, a red herring there. And uh, yeah, uh, actually no, not really. Uh, so the forecast, the winds, 0, 08, 0, 15, gusting 25, um, becoming between 22 and 23 Z. They were expecting it to shift to 0, 040 0 at 8 knots, but they were not expecting a westerly wind at all, really. Tomorrow after 1,200 Zulu, 300 at 10. But yeah, that, that kind of came out of nowhere. That was not in the forecast. That wind just sort of rolled on through. Crazy. Crazy, unexpected crazy.
KLM 219er, welcome to Vancouver. Convenient left turn off the runway and uh, say the gate. Okay, we've got a vacated left, and if possible, we'd take a stand 6 7 for KLM 219. Okay, on 219er, gate 67, uh, not a problem. Turn left on Mike, taxi, Juliet, Juliet Alpha to 67. Okay, Mike, Juliet, Juliet Alpha to 67. Uh, so, uh, okay, on 219. Yeah, unfortunately, this guy just ended up high, but that's just the way it works because of the uh, the the, uh, the fact he got changed around to go around the long way instead of coming in the short way. Who knew that wind was that wind shift was not in the forecast, and I would not. And if I was doing this, you know, just look at the metars as I used to traditionally do the metars right here on the right side every hour, I would totally miss that wind shift. But uh, yeah, ever since I've taken up to using the uh, the live RVR readout, which also has live wind readouts at the airport, it's made it a little bit more realistic. And, and the, the the more fun thing too, I think personally, is that the the winds change. So it's not like you're given the same wind readout for the next hour. Oh, it's zero seven zero at ten gusting twenty three. It's zero seven zero ten gusting twenty three. It's zero seven zero ten gusting twenty three. No, every time I look down, it, it it's the current wind. So it, it it changes almost every every minute. So two seventy at eleven, two sixty at ten. 270 at 19. Like it, it, it's all over the place. Like at least it changes from minute to minute. It sounds a little bit more realistic as well. All right, let's do it this way. Air Canada 26 Heavy, proceed direct sea dust. Air Canada 26 Heavy Vancouver, proceed direct CETUS. Sorry about that. Yep, I was hitting the wrong button. Proceed direct CETUS <laughs> for Air Canada 26 Heavy. Happens to the best of us. And Air Canada 26 Heavy, I'll get you lower in just a couple of miles. I'm just trying to keep you up high so you can stay above 250 until uh, you get a little closer to the other side of the airport there. Appreciate it. Air North 104, Vancouver, are you there? Air North 104. Air North 104, good evening. Squawk code 0743. Or I guess it's still afternoon, really, isn't it? <laughs> 0743, Air North 104. It's, uh, it's 3, 3.40 in the afternoon in Vancouver. Yeah, it's still afternoon. It's not, it's not evening yet. He'll get there. <laughs> codes changing, codes changing, codes changing. Almost. There it is. Air North 104, thank you very much. Identified flight level 370. Welcome. Okay. How far is he from Cetus? He should probably cross Cetus at like 4,500. Maybe even that. Yeah, he's about there now. Air Canada 26 Heavy, when ready, descend 7,000. When ready, descend 7,000, Air Canada 26 Heavy. All right, Calum's on stand. Good stuff. American's about to leave to the north. WestJet's about to leave to the east. Ah, oh, WestJet's got a while to leave to the east. He's got about 15 minutes till he leaves the east. Let's see here. Nope. More like 22 minutes. <laughs> Those are some long lines. Oh, and 
Agent Phil says, does it somewhat line up with what pilots are getting in, injected by the... You know, I don't know. That's an excellent question. I was going to actually ask WestJet when they departed what they were showing for the wins. Because <laughs> that is the other half of the equation, too. Um, I guess, yeah, most of like most of Microsoft Flight Simulator will usually get something based on kind of on the metars. So if you get something that's very out of whack and sudden, you probably won't get it. So I wonder. You know what? You're absolutely right. <laughs> I'll ask. I'll ask our Canada 26 when he turns final for a win readout. Because, yeah. I, and that's what kind of I was debating it. I was debating the, the runway change or not because I was debating like dude because like the Metar is still showing the Metar has been updated it's still showing zero nine zero ten gusting twenty three whereas the live RVR is showing two seventy fourteen gusting twenty like it's completely the opposite end the gusting twenty to something not win so odd uh, what else can I do here I can have a look at the WSI just see what the upper wind forecast is in the vicinity of Vancouver here um, I don't need thirty seven thousand let's go down to twenty let's go down. 10,000 even here. 10,000 winds are supposed to be out of the east. Yeah. 5,000 winds out of the east. 1,000 winds out of the northeast. Yeah, I don't know where this wind in Vancouver came from. Because <laughs> it's completely contradicting the forecasts. Air Canada 26 Heavy Vancouver. Can you give me a uh, wind reading at your current location? It's giving me 100 at 16 knots. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I'm going to ask you for another one just to turn in final here because, yeah, the surface winds are not matching the upper winds at all right now. No worries. Yeah. Oh, that's an excellent question, and that's, that's one of the interesting things you got to kind of watch out for. But I do find that, like... It, it certainly has introduced a little bit more randomness using the spaces here all the time. You know, there's a lot of flight planning graphics, turbulence, turbulence, and lower level speed and directional shear from a strong low pressure system off the coast surface to 8,000 causing moderate severe, moderate clear air turbulence. Nobody's reported any turbulence to me, but uh, that's from the surface to 8,000 feet. American 221 Vancouver, you're just leaving my airspace to the northeast. Edmonton uh, Center's not online. You can switch the route frequency. Surveillance service terminates. Have a great day. Over to Unicom, American 221. Have a great day, sir, and thanks for the ATC. Thanks, you too. Thank you for the great ATC as well. <laughs> he knows what I mean. All right, this Edmonton guy's lucking out. There's a tower in Edmonton now, too, so he's going to get some good service when he gets there. Yeah, it's weird how the surface wind of the airport just suddenly bonkers out of the west. In the real world, that probably threw them for a bit of a loop. Like, oh, going to have to do a full-on runway change here in the middle of the day on a day where they were not expecting it because the forecast says it's going to be out of the east for the rest of the day and all and half tomorrow at least. So that must have uh, that must have sent the airport into a bit of an odd spin there. But yeah, it definitely looks like operations are to the west. There is some stuff going on, though. It looks like two guys did a go-around here, potentially. Something's going on there, because there's two guys. I'm looking at Flight Aware's live map here. There's two guys who are at the departure, two arrivals that are at the departure end of the airport that obviously uh, went somewhere. They did, like, a, an approach. But then they must have uh, they must have done they must have done go arounds. Whether it was for wind shear, possibly could have been for wind shear, or could have been for somebody on the runway. But yeah, they're definitely uh, in a west operation right now. I called it right. 
But yeah, if you go look at FlightAware right now, see if I can pull this up for a second here. Uh, if I can do this really quickly here, is this going to overlay the right browser? Is going to overlay the wrong browser? Yeah, there it is. So see these two guys over here on the west side, blue for blue for um, arrivals, but somehow they're past the airport. So both two airplanes in a row did a go-around of some kind, whether it was something on the runway or whether it was wind shear, who knows. If anyone's listening to live ATC instead of me, I guess they could tell me, but I hope none of you are listening to live ATC. I want you to pay attention to me. <laughs> Anyways, kind of interesting, though. Air Canada 2-6 Heavy, descend 5,000. Descend 5,000 for Air Canada 2 Oh, listen to you. It's all about you. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's my stream. It's all about me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fort Mac Towers online. Yeah, here comes Edmonton Center for the last hour of my uh, stream here. Where it looks like we'll have some good stuff going on in Edmonton. Hopefully, we'll get a little bit of activity on this side of the border, too. Send just, you know, hitting some stuff over their direction. Air Canada 26 heavy vectors to final fly heading 150. 150 for Air Canada 26 heavy. Guess I shouldn't turn too soon because there's still a wind out of the east, probably. Air Canada 26 Heavy, descend 3000. Descend 3000 for Air Canada 26 Heavy. There's a bunch of stuff. Oh, and there's a tower in Yellowknife as well. So there's a tower in Yellowknife. There's a tower in Fort, Ma uh, in Fort Mac. There's a tower in Edmonton. There's Edmonton Approach. Just wait for Edmonton Center to come online. Things are hopping down in the, the Edmonton FIR now, that's for sure. <laughs> Not here. Here it's boring. But things are happening in Edmonton. Air Canada 2-6 Heavy. Turn right heading uh, 2 3 zero for the intercept. Cleared ILS from a 2-6 right. Turn right 230 for the ILS 26 right, Air Canada 26 heavy. Hope I didn't wait too long there. Should be okay. You should be able to make that turn. He's a heavy. It's triple seven? No, eight Dreamliner. As long as he punches the uh, button there, it'll capture. <laughs> the key is punching that button in time. He's got the heading in there. This might turn this might turn out real nice here. Or it might have been just a, just a fra fraction too late. And we can't 2-6 heavy. Looks like uh, Vector you just a second too late there. If you haven't got the uh, localizer already captured, continue the right turn 2 9 to re-intercept. I've got the localizer captured. It's just readjusting itself. Uh, I should be good. Air can't 2-6 heavy. Perfect. Thank you. And Air can't 2-6 heavy, when you're able, I'd appreciate a, a wind read out there at 3,000. Wind reading is 0 at 12. 083 at 12. Perfect. Thank you. Air Canada 26 heavy. The surface winds are showing at 270, 9 gust 18, clear to land, runway 26 right. And if you could, just let me know if you do get any uh, shear or anything like that on uh, final. Clear to land 26 right, then we'll advise Air Canada 26 heavy. Thank you. 
Yeah, you got me thinking about it because that happens a lot with certain configurations. That does happen a lot. I'm trying to think of which configurations, um, but Toronto's one where oftentimes when you're landing east, Montreal, same thing. When you when you have an east landing, you'll often have a tailwind until uh, until you get down to like a thousand or five hundred feet. That's very common, very common occurrence to get that tailwind until uh, until short final even. So even when the surface winds are out of the east, usually the upper winds are out of the west. Not always, but but there are places where that's common. Quebec, Quebec City, anywhere in this that kind of corridor, I guess. But Quebec City is another one where that's very common to happen. When you're landing east, you get end up with a tailwind for a good portion of the approach, which can be very challenging because that increases your ground speed, which increases your required rate of descent. It can be, and uh, because your increased rate of descent, it can be very challenging for pilot if you're not on the ball, if you're not um, speed back early enough. That can that can create a real problem for you. You may not be able to slow the aircraft down. If you've got a heavy aircraft, one that's that's near the upper end of the landing weight range, you know, it, it, you're not configured early enough. You don't have enough flaps out and drag out early enough. You can you can end up really far behind the eight ball with an airplane that's going too fast and it won't slow down because it has to descend at a certain rate to stay on the glide slope. You got to make sure that the, you've got enough drag early enough. And that's what the, the tailwind approaches. It can be very challenging. But at the end of the day, like with the, with the approach, it really comes down to what's the surface wind doing. Like that's the that's the most critical thing. I'm still I'm still kind of looking over here at this. Uh, um, uh, flight aware view of Vancouver. Those airplanes that did the go around, they're getting vectored now back onto base. So something must have run out on the runway. Maybe it's either wind shear or something ran out on the runway, and they uh, they had to whip out, they had to wait a little while till uh, that was cleared up. All right, getting down there. Feel like we're not going to get all that much more traffic here, unfortunately. Edmonton's going to steal it all now with their event, which is fine. Let them have their traffic. I'm a little disappointed. They've got more traffic going on over there than I do over here. It is what it is. Got it. Any new inbounds? Air North, yeah, we know about him, and then Jazz. Yeah, they're getting there. We'll probably get the Jazz in there, because he'll be here before Midnight Zulu, but the Aero Mexico from uh, Mexico City is now not showing a rifle until Midnight 56 Zulu. That's going to be long after. I've got to get out of here. Come on. Brakes, reverse, spoilers, come on. <laughs> He's careening towards the end of the runway real quick there. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Not going to distract him because he's obviously having a stressful landing there. Yeah, I think he's going to be okay, but he's going to use every inch of that runway. <laughs> Air Canada 26, welcome to Vancouver. A left turn at the end there. And uh, Taxi Mike, and what gate are you going to? Yeah, sorry about that. We uh, we overran that a little bit. Uh, gate fifty two, if possible, and on descent at about a thousand feet, winds were zero eight zero at thirteen. All right. Um, would you say that uh, the sim was showing you a headwind though on landing, or uh, hard to tell? It it seemed like a tailwind, but it was uh, yeah. I think it. I, I overshot it a little bit. Air Canada 26, yeah, I was starting to get a little nervous there on your uh, landing roll, but no problem for uh, gate 57. Continue taxi, Mike, uh, Juliet, Juliet Bravo 2, uh, uh, 57. It, uh, yeah, there's a big conflict between the uh, the METAR and the current surface winds. The METAR, just at, like five minutes after the METAR came out, the whole thing shifted 180 degrees, but uh, it's not reflected yet, I guess, in the sim. Uh, no worries. So just, can you repeat that taxi for me again, please? Yeah, taxi.
All right, should be back there. <laughs> Lost my connection momentarily. Lost my connection to the network there momentarily. I think I've been uh, connected to this Wi-Fi network for 24 hours, so it needed a renewal. Oh, And because literally everything timed out, even my tablet, which is connected to the same Wi-Fi device, timed out at the exact same time. So everything's like, yep, goodbye, hello again. Funny. Yeah, looks like I've got everything back online, though. <laughs> Never fails. Everything suddenly vanished offline. I'm like, what's going on? And then I, and then I looked at the clock. And I'm like, oh yeah, I think I have been here for 24 hours. <laughs> it probably has been exactly 24 hours since I logged into this network. So, hoi, hoi, hoi. yeah. Okay, so that's good. That's fine. That's reconnected. Put that there. He's there. Oh, and he missed it. Oh, okay. And Air Canada 26. Looks like you missed Mike. It's not a problem. Just continue hotel. Uh, left on Lima and left on Juliet. Continue hotel, left on Lima, and then on to Juliet. Sorry about that. No problem. Actually, Aircat 26, change of plans. Make the next left on to Victor. It'll probably be bit better for your size of aircraft. Left on Victor and right on uh, Kilo. Left on Victor, right on Kilo for Aircat 26 Heavy. Julia could be a little bit tight for a heavy. There's nobody parked there, but somebody could spawn in at any second, too. That's the, that's the other thing. Okay, November 828, eight, Sierra Tango. I don't even know who you are or where you are or why you're talking to me. I don't even have a November 828, eight, Sierra Tango here listed, so let's just see if I can find him. Do, 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 do. Always challenging to find people. Number 828 eight, Sierra Tango. Okay. <laughs> uh, come on. This thing is very uh, adamant about kicking everything out after 24 hours. My tablet has also lost its connection to the internet, which is a shame because that's where all my weather is coming from, but I think I got it back now. Do, 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 do. There it is, St. John's. Why is it showing me St. John's? <laughs> I think you're a little bit out of out of whack there. There it is, Vancouver. All right, there he goes into the gate. Nobody in Victoria. Air North is still like 300, 400 miles away here. What is that, 400 miles? Yeah, 350, yeah, it was pretty close. Not going to bother giving him any update on the information just yet. West is about to leave to the east. Oh, 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 Edmonton's online now. There we go. That's what I was waiting for. Cody. WestJet 160, contact Edmonton Center now. One tree five decimal zero two. Have a good night. Uh, one three five decimal zero two for WestJet 160. Thanks a lot. Have a good night. Good night. All right, good. That's kind of what I was hoping. I was, I was figuring at some point soon where Edmonton was going to get a center controller, so I'd be able to hand this guy to somebody. So yeah, perfect, love it. Got there just in the nick of time. I was just about turfing to Unicom, anyways. But there we go. Got quite a few people hanging out here, but still nobody's coming to Vancouver. Air North. I got this Jazz coming up from the south, and that's it. So here's hoping maybe we'll get a couple departures going out of Vancouver up to uh, Edmonton, Calgary. It's kind of what I'm hoping at this point. Holding out hope. Oh, you know what? All my ATIS has vanished too because of the because uh, of the unpleasantness with the internet connection. 
We can never go back. There. <laughs> like I like looked at Vatspy, I'm like, where are all my ADISs? Oh yeah, because they all disconnected as well when I when I got ditched. That's it. I got West I got Air North 104. That's all the activity I got for the next uh <laughs> <laughs> who knows how long I'm not even going to talk to him again for 20-30 minutes until he's uh, another at least 150 miles closer to Vancouver I'll start giving him some arrival information so yeah great time to start thinking about what you guys want to talk about again anything else exciting in the news certainly for flights in world um, trying to think what uh, what else recently transpired I mean yeah that uh, I'm definitely excited about that ATR I think that'll be a fun airplane that'll fill a big niche and uh Uh, yeah, that that'll fill a big niche, and um, so will. Uh, what am I trying to say here? Sorry, I'm just trying to log into this network here again. Um, but yeah, it, it, that'll fill a big niche. Um, the triple seven will fill like a big, like long haul, heavy aircraft niche that nobody's really filled yet. Either that or the three thirty, and then at the other end of the spectrum, in a way, uh, certainly in terms of the transport category aircraft, the ATR will fill a totally different niche. But I think that's that's going to be a really good one as well. The the only trouble with the ATRs is not very popular in North America. Is that's where the dash really kind of shone for a while, but even the dash is not that popular anymore. The the most the, most of the airlines have gotten away from the dash. They've all moved on to CRJs, and then it's funny because even the CRJ is not a very uh, it, it the CRJ is no longer in production. Um, the Embraers. Vancouver Standard Air Canada two six heavy. We're going to shut it down right here. We appreciate the service. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of your afternoon, Air Canada two six heavy. Air Canada 26 Heavy, no problem. Have a great night, and we'll see you next time. Um, yeah, like, it's it's funny, but the regional market has almost evaporated in terms of airplane manufacture, which is ironic because, like, the narrow-body market has never been bigger. There are so many, there's something like 10,000 narrow-body aircraft on order right now. It's like, it's a ridiculous number of narrow-body aircraft on order. The heavies, not so much. There's there's quite a few heavies on order, but not quite not quite so much. Uh, but the regional market is just just collapsed in terms of aircraft sales. Um, it, it's not just it's not just sales, but just in terms of um, products. Uh, the CRJ line was finally terminated after years and years of successful production. And yeah, it's a bit of a small tin can. It's not a particularly uh, appealing aircraft. You, you take it because you got to to get to the smaller tier cities. And the airlines like it because it's pretty cheap to operate through their regional affiliates. But Bombardier pulled the plug, sold it to Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi said, we're not going to make them. We'll service them, but we're not going to make them. They were. I think the idea was they were going to use the technology to support their, their uh, Japanese regional aircraft that they were developing, but it never really still has not really materialized. And I think that's been put on the back burner. So Mitsubishi owns the rights to the CRJ. They're just going to continue servicing the existing ones. They're not going to make new ones. Um, the And then the Embraer. The 175 is still in production. The 175 V2 has been indefinitely shelved um, because it was the whole thing was the whole thing just like kind of blew my mind it's too big of an aircraft for the regional market and and i don't know who at embraer okay this the, the development of this aircraft because whoever did botched it big time the unions in the u.s uh, the airline unions are very powerful in the u.s they, they really are they're, they're some pretty big powerful unions they got some pretty ironclad agreements um in terms of scope clauses in terms of what is a, a regional aircraft and what has to be flown by a mainline pilot and the scope clauses usually work by one of two conditions or possibly both and it usually has to deal with weight and passenger capacity and the Embraer 175 pretty much exceeded both targets. So, so in all cases, the Embraer is would now, even though it's only just barely a couple of aircraft, a couple of seats bigger. I think it's like one or maybe two rows bigger, because of the number of passengers in the V2 of the Embraer 175, uh, and the and the new higher takeoff weight that's allowed. Uh, in both cases, it pushes it beyond the scope clause and into mainline flying. So only the mainline airlines could buy the Embraer 175 and fly them, and they're not interested in flying them because they're too small for the salaries that they pay to their their pilots. There's there's no point in flying around an aircraft that small for that large a salary. That's why they, they outsource them to regions where they can pay a lower salary. It's kind of a dirty business, but that's the nature of the business. You know, my, whether, whether I, I think that's right or not, doesn't it doesn't change the reality of where the industry is right now and the industry is 
you know, especially right now, the airline unions have so much power because the, there's such a, a pilot shortage going on in the U.S. So, I don't know, who at Embraer okayed this aircraft with the stats that they had on it and said, yes, build it bigger, build it for more people, it's fine, we'll sell it. Nobody's buying it. Nobody, nobody, nobody can buy it. So nobody will buy it. So it's the market. The the the, the product has been shelved. So um, I, I believe they're still making the V the the, the Embraer V ones, the original E Jet V Embraers. Um, but even that, like they they really haven't sold too many orders. The C series is really just sort of coming out of the coming out of the gate, firing on all cylinders. It's a it's a decent sized airplane. It's bigger than the Embraer one nineties. Um, but you get similar cost numbers to the to the 190s. You get a very a very efficient cost structure, like uh, very low fuel burn. That's about the only. That's that's about the closest thing to a regional jet being manufactured right now. Now in the turboprop sec sector, there's a few more, but the American airlines have shied away from the turboprops now for a decade or two. It used to be 10, 20 years ago, all the uh, all the airlines in North America had regional operators that were operating at least some turboprops, probably mixed with some some regional jets as well, but they were almost all were operating at least some turboprops as well. Uh, Dash 8s primarily, a lot of Dash 8s, some ATRs as well, but primarily Dash 8s. And uh, even that has kind of collapsed. Everyone kind of got away from the turboprops. Oh, they're noisy. They're, they they shake and rattle and everything. I'm like, have you ever been inside a CRJ? You want to talk about shaking and rattling, but... Um, yeah, there's a there's a mindset in North America about uh, turboprops, and and airlines just completely stepped away from them. They 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 al almost not, none of the airlines fly uh, have regional partners that fly their turboprops under their banner anymore, with a with a few minor exceptions. Um, Canada is the one place that still the turboprop market is still quite large, uh, and there's a whole bunch of operators flying around with Dash eights, but uh, in the U.S. Dash eight operators are a lot rarer, and uh, people, the, the major airlines, all went with regional jets. It's fine for now, but right now there's no regional jets on the market. Where, uh, you know, and and you know these airplanes don't have infinite lifespans. At some point, they're going to have to get replaced. The one S seventy five, as it is right now, cannot fill that niche. The CRJ simply. S stopped manufacture, got sold to a different company that decided they were not interested in manufacturing the airplane anymore. So there's literally, all of a sudden, there's nothing, there's, there's no products on the market in the, in the regional jet market in North America. And it's like, what just happened here? We went from having all these regional jets being sold, built and sold, to there's just none. And they're just all aging up, rattling around the, rattling around all the backwaters of, of North America. I mean, never mind the fact that the regional airlines are parking airplanes anyways. They have more regional jets than they know what to do with because they can't find the pilots to sit in the front of them. But in the long term, at some point, there's probably going to be a little bit of a give back in the other way, where there's the, the number of pilot jobs is going to somewhat, the number of pilots having jobs is going to take off again. But you know, when these fleets come up for renewal, there's no product on the market, and there's no product even on the horizon. The closest thing is the E2, and the E2 is stuck in an impossible position. It's too big. They have to, they'd have to go back to the drawing board and come up with an E, uh, the you know, E2.1 that has a, again a lower lower takeoff weight, a lower passenger load so that it can fit in the scope clauses because none of those American airlines are going to open up that scope clause anytime soon. The, 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 with the pilot shortage the way it is, the power is in the union's hands at this point. Uh, the airlines may try to play hardball, but at the end of the day, there's way too many airlines chasing way too few pilots. The last thing any of them can afford to do is make life unpleasant for their pilots. I don't think there's too many operators at the ATR in North America. It's mostly the Dash 8 is preferred. A lot of other places around the world, a lot in Europe, but uh, not so much in North America. I'm just trying to have a look here and see who in North America even operates ATRs. Calm Air and Canadian North. Empire Airlines, even FedEx offers some, operates some ATR. So there are a handful flying around, but uh, definitely not all that many. Morningstar, yeah, like like, but most of these air, and most these operators are operating a very small number. One, two, three, four. Nobody's operating them in any great number. 
or say uh and it's mostly Canadians, really at the end of the day, very few American carriers. Silver Airways has five. And uh Empire Airlines has seven. FedEx has quite a lot, twenty nine. It's about it though. It's really not a big market. It never has been. The, the, the ATR never really made a big breakthrough into North North America. And it used to be that there were a lot of American airlines that oper operated them, but they're mostly gone now. Just look, I'm literally looking through Wikipedia at the lists right now, and there's really not that many. There's a bunch in Canada. Canada's been a big proponent of Turbo Prost because there's a lot of smaller airports that place that, that they need to get into where jets just are not feasible either because of runway length, terrain restrictions, um, all sorts of stuff. But there's lots of places in North America, in Canada where uh, places that are remote that need air service, that, 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 that there's no other way to get around except for air service, but... Uh, Either the runways are short, the approaches are steep, and so the turboprops are the only way to fill that niche. Whereas in, in the U.S., that that's they've all but fallen by the wayside. Where there used to be hundreds of them being operated by airlines, you know, like Horizon and uh, uh, Horizon and who else, Colgan, and you know the likes of those. It, it, they've really kind of fallen apart now. They've all switched. They all switched up to regional jets. They all bought regional jets. They all switched up to regional jets, and now, ironically. No regional jets are being manufactured. So I'm just looking I'm just looking at Wikipedia here to see like what's on the regional jet market. The only thing that's really being manufactured right now is Sukhoi Superjet. Nobody's going to buy that. <laughs> Nobody's going to buy that, so you're kind of really stuck. Embraer E2, not really something's going to get... I mean, and Comax ARJ21, Antonov AN148, like... The Comax ARJ21 is about the only one that has a fighting chance, because nobody's going to buy... Uh, the Sukhoi, Antonov, I don't know if they can really actually make anything right now. Embraer, the 190 is kind of selling even a few of those, but even this, the 190 is not really sell, selling that many. Uh, let's see here. I can find numbers on it right now. Yeah, it, it, it's a market that just completely collapsed, and it's like there were there's thousands of them in the market right now. But uh, they're going to start aging up. They, they were all kind of built around the same time in the 90s and 2000s and even 2010s. And they're going to start aging out in the next 5 to 10 years. They're going to start aging out and there's going to be very little to replace them. The only thing that's really being sold right now is the, the E2, the 190 version. And even that, they're really not selling that many, all things considered, unfortunately. Let's see if I can find the page on the E2. So yeah, I'm just trying to find the numbers here on the E2. And yeah, so the 190 E2, 25 orders, the 195 E2, 245 orders. And that's the only thing. But the, but again, the, the trouble with that is, is is scope clauses in North America, at least. None of the regional airlines can operate this airplane. It's too big. It has to be operated as a mainline airplane by, by the regional operators. So it, 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 the only North American buyer of the 195 has been Porter because they're their own independent airline. They can, you know, they're not a, a regional mainline kind of operation. They can buy what they want, but that's about it. Everybody else is, uh, nobody else can touch them. So all these airplanes are just going to slowly age up and there's literally no replacement even in the offing right now. The closest thing to a replacement is a Comac ARJ, uh, what is it, what did I say, the ARJ21 or whatever. And even that, like I, I I think that's going to be a hard sell in the North American market. Chinese Chinese built aircraft, Chinese designed aircraft, the Air J21 in uh, 
it's, that's, I think that's going to be a hard sell in the North American market, to be honest. Just trying to see. The only people that have ordered the ARJ21 outside of China, the Republic of Congo, uh, an airline here called Maruk Enterprises from Indonesia. Uh, another uh, an airline from Laos and GCAS, which is the uh, GE Capital Aviation Services, which is just a leasing company. It's based in America, but it's just a leasing company. But no actual airlines. Outside of China, the only three countries that have had a reported sale of the ARJ-21, Congo, Laos, and uh, Indonesia. And, and like I said, like I, I don't see them breaking into the American market. People, American especially, American now especially has become very suspicious of Chinese goods. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be very hard sell in the North American market. I'm sure they'd love to break in and being the only regional jet manufacturer, they stand a chance. But again, that's going to be uh, to me. It's going to be a hard sell. I think I don't think the a lot of American airlines are going to touch it. They're going to they're going to they're going to shop around really hard to try and find something more uh, Western focused, whether it be whether it be something from Airbus or something from uh, or or even Embraer. I think they'd rather settle for an Embraer over a Chinese built aircraft. Anyways, I, I I don't know, but it just it's it seems like a huge kind of gaping hole. Uh, and it's not, it's one of those things, it's a, it's a, it's like a demographic shift. It, 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 it doesn't happen overnight, but it's just going to sneak up on you little by little. And all of a sudden, one day it's just going to crack wide open and then it's going to be like, our planes are getting too old. We're having to retire them. And we got nothing to replace them. Nothing. And they're buying all these narrow bodies. Like that's the crazy thing too, is the number of narrow body aircraft on order. It's just insane right now. All right, let's just have a look here. Um, okay, let's have a look here. The Airbus A320 family. I just want to see what the order book looks like right now. But the order book is ridiculous right now. Uh, da, 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 da. So orders for the A320 Classic. The backlog is down to twenty, whereas the the backlog for the uh, entire A three twenty Neo family currently stands at sixty one hundred planes. Sixty one hundred planes currently on back order, which is insane. Because in its history, they've they've only made like eleven thousand Airbuses, and now they want to like. 50% of the all the Airbuses that have ever been made, all the A320 families that have ever been made, are ba on now on order again. Like it, it, It's crazy how many are on order right now. And the Boeing is not doing as well, but it's it's in a similar situation where they, 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 it's, it's multiple thousands on order. Let's just have a look here at this order book. Uh... Orders da, 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 da. delivers. So, right now the unfilled orders for the Max stands at about forty-two hundred. So, yeah, between the seven thirty-seven and the three twenty family, there's almost ten thousand narrow-body aircraft on order, which is that that's a long order book. It's gonna it's gonna take five, six, seven, eight years for them to to even start to really deliver a significant portion of those. But. Yeah. There's there's a lot of smaller markets that just are not going to be served by a narrow body airliner. Like they're just even with with leaps in efficiency, it's just not worth putting an an airplane, uh, a larger airplane on these markets. In some places, some some cases, it's just not practical. You need a smaller aircraft to get into some of these smaller airports, some of these smaller cities. But some of these smaller cities, where you know, I, I guess I guess your option is instead of having a daily regional jet flight, you can do a couple times a week with a with a narrow body aircraft instead and get the same seating capacity averaged across the week. But I guess that's the way the airlines are going to go because it just it, in North America the, the regional jets have, the regional market has almost disappeared, and especially in the U.S. Um, it, it, the regional market hasn't disappeared, but 
there's no planes. Nobody's going to buy any turboprops in that market. They just they just don't want to do it for their passengers. What are you left with? There's no regional jets on the market anymore. But it's like it's it's like it's like a demographic time bomb. It's not going to happen overnight. But all of a sudden, one day, all the airlines going to kind of wake up at the same time and say, "Oh, we are all screwed because we all are, we all have our airplanes. They're all reaching the same age. We're retiring all of them, and we have nothing to replace them with." And it takes a long time to bring an airplane to market. That's the other thing. Like it, it's not an easy thing. Like at a minimum, you're looking at a five year investment to bring an airplane to market. Minimum, and probably plan on closer to ten. So if you want to start replacing those airplanes in the mid, in the early to mid twenty thirties, you got to start putting some product. You got to start putting some designs together now, so you can start the flight testing and you can start replacing them. And nobody seems interested. Embraer seems the only ones that are interested. But as I said, somebody. Somebody screwed up Royal at Embraer and approved a design that does not meet the U.S. market's needs, not even close. And I think they were hoping that they're just going to that they're just going to get a renegotiation. Oh yeah, you know they'll renegotiate all the collective agreements. It'll be fine. We'll we'll get we'll get what we need. It's like not necessarily. Don't don't bet on that because right now, the the demographic shift that's happened in terms of the pilots being in such short supply and high demand. Yeah, they're they're not going to take a, that renegotiation easily, and uh, probably what they would want for, to negotiate the scope clause upwards is not going to happen at the regional level. The only way those E-175s will sell is if, as if mainline North American airlines decide to bring all regional flying back in house. And why would they do that? They just can't afford it, unless they don't have a choice. Unless there's no other way to do it. I don't see it working out e- e- very well either way for these airlines, but it's going to take 10 to 15 years. Their, their sites are all set on the narrow bodies right now on some rejuvenation of some of the wide body stuff with a 350, um, 777, uh, the 777 X if it ever comes out, like those sort of things. Regional flying is just sort of one of those things that just, <clears throat> it's not uh, it's not sexy. It doesn't necessarily sell. Uh, it doesn't look good necessarily on the, on the uh, you know, in the in the company numbers. It doesn't look good to the shareholders. So it's something they're not really worrying too much about. Yeah, triple seven X. Well, deliveries delayed multiple times. Expect to commence delivery in twenty twenty five. So it's getting there. It's getting there. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I Sometimes I wonder, like, what, what what's going on in the upper echelons of this industry? Because how is this, you know, how is this blind spot for the regionals just sort of creeping in there so badly? The Dash 8s are still in production, but outside of Canada, nobody wants the Dash 8s. So I don't know if the American Airlines are all hoping there'll be just enough growth in the business that, oh, they can just keep it going with um, just, just, just put narrow bodies on every route. You know, 320, 320 or 37 service on every route. Cut down the frequency, maybe. I guess that's the long term plan. Because Lord knows they got enough of these airplanes on order. They're going to need to find something to do with them. Anyways. What do we got? We got about a half an hour left here. Enough time to get this Air North in. We got Jazz coming up from the south, and that's going to be about the end of it, folks. All this time here, and still nobody wants to come and dress, <laughs> come visit me. <laughs> Edmonton's got their little event going on, and they got all sorts of people there. And it's wow, they got five guys on the ground in Yellowknife. I don't think I've ever seen five airplanes on the ground in Yellowknife. <laughs> they got five guys on the ground in Yellowknife, four guys on the ground in Fort Mac, somebody in Red Deer, two guys in Edmonton. They're having a good little event here. They're having a good little event there. They're keeping themselves busy. That's good. I mean, good for them. Oh, I got somebody logged in. We might get one more additional airplane. So we got two inbounds. We might get an outbound here in the next half an hour as well. But <laughs> I got to say, like some of these events, though, they are working well for guys. Like, like this is a pretty recent thing that uh, I've been kind of started this Tuesday training night. Um, it's not necessarily a training night, but it is, it is, it's, 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 it's a, it's a no night. It's like Moncton Mondays. It's where everybody 
comes a, to, makes a point to, to come and lock in somewhere in Edmonton on Tuesday night. So, and the pilots seem to know this because they're here. I wonder how many of them might be Edmonton controllers too, but <laughs> I think I recognize a couple of names anyways. But yeah, the people, they know this. Got all sorts of guys going yellow knife down to Edmonton, yellow knife down to Calgary, Fort Mac. Got a couple guys filed over to Castlecar, but I don't think they're going to make it to Castlecar before I'm out of here. Guys going back up to yellow knife. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, more power to these, to these guys, like for putting together this event, sticking to it regularly. Because if that's is like that, like you, you got to build people's habits. You got to build, you got to build some, some knowledge and popularity. And, and when you do that, it does pay off in the long run. Ask Moncton. Their, their event is fantastic. Air North 104, Vancouver Center. Information in Vancouver is now Foxtrot, runway 26 right for arrival. We'll uh, pick up Foxtrot and uh, expect 26 right Air North 104. Air North 104, thank you. When ready, descend flight level 290. When ready, descend 290, North 104. Yeah, kudos to these guys because it seems to be working for them, and it's not an easy thing because you got to stick with it for the, you know, you, you have to stick with this kind of an event where you're having a weekly event and you're trying to lure people, and you got to stick with it for a couple months. It, it, the first few times you do it, not much is going to happen, but you just need to 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 stick with it to make people just get used to the idea and see it regularly, and then they they know it's there. Like Moncton, like Monday, if I if I'm ever around on a Monday and I and I. Thinking about going flying, my first thing is, oh, is it is it uh, time for Monk to Bundy yet? I, I barely even, you know, I, it's just it's an automatic thought. Why? Because it's been it's been, I don't even know how this event's gone on for years and years. This event has gone on for anyway, so you know there's going to be at least a handful of guys. You don't know how many. Some days, some weeks more, some weeks less, but you know for sure there's going to be some staff out there. It's going to be worth worth your time. And it looks like uh, I have to say, Edmonton is doing a very good job with their Tuesdays here and. It's fairly consistent. We got quite a few guys on here. Uh, we got, uh, let's see, they've got uh, center controller, three towers, and an approach controller. It's a reasonable output. And it, it, it's it's enough to, you know, give people some random stuff to fly between. Fort Mac, Yellowknife, Edmonton. There's there's a decent amount of airports. Um, you know, and, and those are all good, decent stage lengths as well. You're talking like, you know, 40, 40 minute to an hour and a half flights. These are just like the perfect thing for doing a, doing a nice little VATSIM session. So. Yeah, more power to these guys. I'm a little jealous again because <laughs> they're getting the traffic I'm not getting. I've been here for three and a half hours, and some of these guys have seen more, more act, almost more activity in the last 30 minutes than I have in three and a half hours. Yeah, Vancouver's hit or miss. Some days it's really quite busy. Today it's a gamble. The gamble did not pay off. It didn't turn out to be that busy. It's the way it is sometimes. That's okay, because Cross the Bottom is coming up this weekend. I'm going to probably live stream it, and uh, it looks like I may be available for a la much larger portion of it than I had originally anticipated, which is just... It, it's, it's, it's almost making all the stuff that's going on this week worthwhile, because, boy, has it turned into a bit of a bear this week. It really has, but, uh, yeah. So I think this guy 360, I think that's the Jazz. Yeah, that's my Jazz inbound there. Hopefully he'll start descending properly on the star at the appropriate time. You can tell when I'm running out of stuff to talk about. <laughs> Just about at the end there. Where's this guy going to go? 
This guy logged in in Kelowna. I don't think I even have Kelowna up, do I? Because I haven't needed it yet. <laughs> there it is. No flight plan. WestJet 5142, but no flight plan. Well, you got about 30 minutes, buddy. Then I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to bail on you. Yeah. But I do run out of <laughs> run out of stuff to talk about before the four hour mark is up. At least when we're flying, it kind of triggers stuff and sitting here doing ATC really doesn't trigger too much stuff. Not much really happens here. See if there's anything else recently worth talking about. There was a uh, fly-by-wire talked a little bit about their A380. Um, showed a talk to they had they, so there was there's an article here apparently they were on a podcast and they were talking about the development of the flight deck for the A380 how they've how they've looked at it and the the the, the level the effort they went to, uh, which actually I find I find very impressive. Um, they actually have gotten a hold of actual pieces of the A380. Um, manufactured by Airbus and uh, and they basically taken these things apart to see how they're put together to make sure that what they're putting together is very realistic so um, for example the way things are weathered when paint wears off of things what color is it underneath um, and so when they're trying to do wear they're trying to make sure that the wear looks realistic by knowing uh, what it's how it's built what it's made of and, and showing what's 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 underneath correctly um, the other thing too is like seeing like how the lights are put together um, so all these little light up switches on the autopilot panel in the in the a380 how are they actually lit up and so they actually took it apart and they found out you know like there's three different LEDs in there and all those sort of things um, and, and so, you know, that way they can try to model the lighting of these switches very realistically instead of just sort of being just a block of green. They're trying to actually make it look like there's three LEDs mounted behind there. So they're trying to make it, 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 it sounds like an insane level of detail, especially for something that I'm assuming is going to be a freeware product because that's what Fly-By-Wire does. They're, they're, you know, the A3 and X is, um, is, a, fly, is, a, is a free product, I'm, a, I'm assuming. It's going to be free. Maybe they are going to change, charge for the A380. The level of detail that they're going to, and if they they achieve that level of detail, that will be uh, that'll be a very realist or a very reasonable uh, thing to charge for if they're going to do what they're talking about. All right, there goes my guy. He did. He filed a flight plan out to Edmonton. No surprise there. Out of Kelowna. So let's just go back to Kelowna and review these NOTAMs again and see which, which end of the runway is closed here. Because <laughs> that was, I was confused. <laughs> I understood at the time, but then I've already forgotten. So 1634 north of taxiway office, not available as a taxiway. Yeah, not available as a taxiway. Um... First 1,025 feet of runway 16 closed. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. I think I I think I understand. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Yeah, well, needless to say, a little bit confusing. Air North 104, continue descent 12, 1, 2000, Vancouver altimeter 2982. Continue to descent uh, 12, 1, 2, 0, and uh, 2982 Air North 104. Rich. Hmm. All right, so here comes Jazz 765 between Air North, Jazz 765, and this one departure. That's probably going to be the end of my shift because I had planned to sign off pretty much around the hour. 
this guy, if he gets his stuff in gear, he'll get going in time, and I'll get him off to uh, Edmonton, Edmonton Center. But uh, yeah, these two guys should definitely arrive and land in that time. And uh, yeah, pretty much run out of time for everybody else. So there's no nobody else anyways inbound. That, just that Aeromexico 696, and that is it. It's more than a little disappointing. I would have thought four hours. I kind of caught kind of early in the afternoon. I would have thought I would have caught more traffic than this. But even Toronto, where the guys have not been on there for hours, there's four guys on the ground already. Like Vancouver's just hit or miss sometimes, and today's a miss. It's a shame because it is the second most staffed FIR in Canada, so it's a little bit disappointing. Not going to live stream Vancouver again, I guess. Jazz 765, you with uh, Vancouver Center? Not yet. Not yet. Chaz, 765, Vancouver. Not going to be as quick on the trigger as it was the last time when I pinged him just as he was calling me. <laughs> Jazz 765 Vancouver. Oh, this guy better call me. <laughs> this better not be one of those like si sidle in silently situations. Jazz seven six five Vancouver. Good uh, evening, Squawkadent. I guess it's still afternoon there, isn't it? What time is it there? Eh, you can still call it evening if you want to, I guess. Jazz seven sixty five uh, Vancouver. Thank you very much. Identify descending through twelve thousand. Vancouver altimeter is two nine or eight two. Uh, information Foxtrot runway two six right. Descend eight thousand. Descend 
Still no sign of my WestJet friend here. I gotta be looking pretty stale now on this network. Oh, actually, it only looks like I've been online for 43 minutes thanks to my momentary disconnection there. <laughs> Darn you. Darn you. Uh, in that case, I look probably pretty fresh. Yeah, doing pretty good in Canada, though. Almost staffed Canada coast to coast right now, except for Montreal. Montreal is the only one that's offline, and there are there is uh, we do actually have a capital and then Montreal approach controller, but just uh, no center control. It's not terrible though. But I am disappointed. We haven't gotten more traffic here. Uh, what would it be like three four zero? Jazz 765 vectors for the ILS fly heading 330. 330 vectors for the ILS. Uh, Air North 104, proceed direct CDES. Direct CDES, and we're uh, planning for the RNAV 26 right, Air North uh, 104. Air North 104, a copy the request for the RNAV uh, 26 right, you can plan on that. We'll uh, plan on that, Air North 104, thank you. Pretty sure there is a CDES transition for that one, is there not? Load it up just to be sure, but I'm pretty sure there is a CDES transition. Vancouver Center. Good afternoon, WestJet 5142 at Kelowna. Request IFR clearance to Edmonton International. Oh, WestJet 5142 Edmonton, or WestJet 5142 Vancouver, you're cleared to Edmonton. Uh, via the Kelowna 8 departure, flight plan route, departure runway 34, squat code 0751. Clear to Edmonton International Airport via the Kelowna 8 departure, squawk 0751, WestJet 5142. WestJet 5142, that readback is all correct. Information Delta's current in Kelowna. Push back and start up at your discretion and call when ready for taxi. We'll call you for taxi, WestJet 5142. Jazz 765, descend 4000. 4000, Jazz 765. Maybe he'll get launched in time. Hopefully, the fact he called for his clearance means he's getting ready for the push. He's airborne. I'll try to get him over to the uh, border. He's not airborne. I'm not going to hang out too long. I've been going for a while here. Whoa, what happened to my background here? <laughs> what happened to that? What happened to my overlay here? That's weird. It went to something completely different. <laughs> what the heck happened there? That's funny. I obviously pressed something at some point while I was not even looking at that screen. That's hilarious. <laughs> well, at least I know my cross the pond banner works. <laughs> I'm ready. Ready for cross the pond again. That's funny. Call that a sneak preview. <laughs> a little reminder of what's coming up, people. It's coming up. It's coming up soon. Hilarious. Hilarious. Air North 104, descend 7,000. 7,000 Air North uh, 104. Oh, and then we got another one on the ground in Vancouver. Yeah, you're getting a little bit late to the party here, buddy. <laughs> I've been here for four hours. Go figure. That's always the way they show up when you're just about ready to shut her down. Always the way.
Jazz 765 to send 3,000. 3,000, Jazz 765. Jazz beat Air North by just a little bit here. Not much, but just a little bit. Jazz 765, turn left heading 290 for the intercept. Clear the ILS, runway 26 right. 290 intercept, clear the ILS, 26 right, Jazz 765. Vancouver Center, WestJet 5142 at Kelowna, ready to taxi. WestJet 1542, Vancouver, runway 34, information Delta, altimeter 299 or 3, taxi Charlie Delta, hold short 34, advise ready. Taxi to runway 34 via Charlie Delta, and we have information Delta, WestJet 5142. Nice, he might just get airborne in time. <laughs> West at 765. I may have given you the turn a little early there. Uh, descend 2000 for the glide slope. You're still clear for the approach. It's not great. I thought I'd uh, time that one pretty well, but apparently I did not. <laughs> oh well. Yeah, I have to give this guy an altitude restriction at sea this because he can't go lower than 5,000 until he passes it pretty much. So, so be it. Thanks for the center. They're getting 683 on the ground across the IFR to Toronto. Air Canada 683, stand by, I'll be right back with you. Okay. Jazz 765, Vancouver winds are uh, 280, 14 gusting 20, clear to land, runway 26 right. Six winds, clear to land, 26 right, Jazz 765. Air North 104, descend 5000. Descend 5000, Air North 104. Air North 104, thanks. Cross Cetus at or above 5000, you're cleared Vancouver, RNAV runway. 26 right CETUS transition. Class CETUS center above 5000 cleared uh, RNAV uh, 26 right there in 105. 
Air Canada 683 Vancouver, you're cleared to Toronto via the Vancouver 2 departure, Vectors flight plan route, depart runway 26 left, squawk code 0744. We are cleared to Toronto via the Vancouver 2 departure, Vectors after departure flight plan route, depart 26 left, squawk 0744, 683. Air Canada 683, the readback is correct. Information Foxtrot is current. Push at your discretion and call for taxi. 683. Westjet 5142. Backtrack is approved if required. Contact me once you're airborne. Kelowna winds 320, 19, gust 28, cleared for takeoff, runway 34. Cleared for takeoff, runway 34, Westjet 5142. Well, this guy's going to be airborne. Edmonton's got a fantastic range, too, so I can get the handoff super early. 683. Air Canada 683, go ahead. Um, I think on SimBrief, the, the two waypoints, Vipta and Dervu, uh, those two waypoints don't actually exist. I don't think uh, the Phoenix was updated, so we're going to need vectors for both of those. All right, uh, Air Canada 683, stand by one, because uh, it's pretty far to that first waypoint, so let me see if I can get you a better waypoint. Okay. Let's see if I can help this guy out here. It's thinking, it's thinking, it's thinking. All right, so it's... Da, 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 uh -huh. Doesn't matter. Uh, let's see here. All right, uh, Air Canada 683, uh, let's do this. Let's amend your clearance. Uh, your first fix will be IWAC, India, Whiskey, Alpha, Charlie, Kilo, and then direct, uh, I believe you said Finbo is the first fix you have this in the database. Uh, yep, wait, sorry, what was the wait, first wave one? Can you type it in the chat? Yep, can do. Okay, thank you. Jazz uh, 765, welcome to Vancouver. And uh, where are you parking today? We're going to Echo 82 for Jazz uh, 765. Jazz 765, Roger, left turn on Mike and Tango into the gate. Mike, Tango into the gate for Jazz 765. Thanks. Air North 104, Vancouver winds 290, 13 gusting 20, clear to land, runway 26 right. Clear to land, 26 right, Air North 104. Vancouver Tower, WestJet 5142 is on runway heading, uh, passing 3,600. WestJet 542 identified, climb flight level 330. And at uh, 9,000, turn right, direct Ramra on course. Climb to flight level 330 three, and turn to Ramra at, I think you said 9,000. West at 5142, that is exactly correct. All right, he's taxiing. Yeah, this guy's not going to get off the ground in time. But I can probably get an early handoff to Edmonton because he's got a fantastic range. So he'll see this guy no problem as soon as he gets uh, just a little bit higher. Hopefully through about 18,000. Maybe I can get him off to Edmonton. And pull the plug because it's been uh, a great four hours of sitting here and controlling very few airplanes. Uh, I think in four hours I have controlled like eight or ten airplanes. <sighs> 
Some days that's just the way Vatsim works. I'm sure that the 8 to 10 people that I did control today were all very grateful for my services, so... So be it. I am a little more, more than a little disappointed, though, for four hours of sitting here, and I'm not able to lure in more craft than this. Edmonton came online, and everyone was ready for their event. Oh, well. Next time we do a stream, we'll do it from Toronto. It never fails to pack them in in Toronto. Can't help but be a little jealous. Oh well. Remember, Cross the Pond is coming up. Cross the Pond will be better. Cross the Pond will be busy no matter what you do, so. <laughs> Just got to reassure myself of that, and it looks like I will be a full-on participant in Cross the Pond this year, unlike, uh, unlike in the fall, where I missed it for the first time in a long time. It's disappointed. I was disappointed when I realized that was going to happen, but some things in life are worth it. This was worth it, but nevertheless, still disappointing that my Cal Ripken streak of school openage, I mean, cross the pond attendance, was, uh, was, finally, was finally crushed. All right, so he looks like he's on course to Ramra. Perfect. Give him like another minute, let him get another three or 4,000 feet higher at least. We're definitely going to get Air North on the ground taxing in. But just not much happening here on this network. Boo. <laughs> Boo. Kind of wanted stuff to happen and nothing is happening. Some days it's just the way it is. Hmm. Air North should be approaching the touchdown point there. I guess I can probably close the Victoria view. I had my one departure out of Victoria. And close the Kelowna view. I had my one departure out of Kelowna. <laughs> Air North, 900 feet, so he's still about two, three miles final. Jazz just out of the gate. Air Canada 683 is not even off the gate yet. It's not even, not even going to be close. All right, here comes the air north. There goes WestJet. I do miss tower view sometimes. <laughs> Should install FSX on this computer just to <laughs> just to have tower view. It may look may look old school, but it's there. Air North 104, welcome to Vancouver. Convenient left turn off the runway, and where are you parking? Uh, left turn off, and we're going to gate 18 for Air North 104. All right, Air North 104, it looks like you got Mike 4 there. Uh, taxi on to uh, Victor Hotel and Golf for Gate 18. Victor Hotel Golf, Gate 18, Air North uh, 104. Thank you so much for your help. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks, you too. Uh, 
All right. I'm going to pull the plug here, so I'm just going to get this handoff going to... Uh, WestJet 5142, contact Edmonton now, 135 decimal 02. Good day. 135 decimal 02 for WestJet 5142. Have a good day. Take care. Air Canada 683, unfortunately, my shift is now over and uh, no relief in sight. So uh, you can go to Unicom for the departure. No further traffic's observed uh, arriving at uh, Vancouver at this time. Hopefully, Edmonton Centre will still be online when you get there. Okay, yeah, thanks for, sir. Thanks for the help with uh, those pesky waypoints. And yeah, I like, uh, have a good evening. <laughs> thanks, you too. And Air North 104, you could just monitor Unicom for the taxi, and uh, one aircraft uh, still parked at the gate, not even pushed yet, so uh, should be no conflict. Well, uh, switch over to Unicom, Air North 104. Uh, thanks for the ATC. Have a good rest of your night. Good night. If anybody else is still on the Vancouver Center frequency, Vancouver Center is closed. Switch to Unicom 122.8. Good night. All right, and that's it for me. I'm out. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I still enjoyed it. It's not as busy as we'd like it to be, but I still enjoyed it, and I still enjoyed uh, having some chat, some topics to chat about, rant about. So, uh, yeah, stick with uh, the channel, guys. Uh, if you haven't already, make sure you like and subscribe uh, down below, because that's what I gotta say. Apparently, in the media world. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, make sure you follow. If you like what you see, make sure you follow so that you get uh, notified next time there's a stream. Currently, the plan is probably the next stream is going to be CTP Day on Saturday. Um, things have changed. I'm going to have to see what I can do about that. But uh, yeah, I'm uh, planning to be available on Saturday. So uh, yeah, uh, hopefully I'll see you guys all then. In the meantime, uh, fly safe, be good to one another, and uh, we'll see you guys all out there on the VATSIM network. Take care.